Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the February 10th regular board meeting of Santa Clara Unified School District. I will start with roll call. So Trustee Canova is absent. Trustee Fairchild? Here. Trustee Gonzalez? Here. Trustee Lieberman? Here. Trustee Ratterman? Absent. Trustee Ryan? Here. Are we going to be able to hear Trustee Ryan? Here. I'm here. <laughs> okay. She's here. I can see her waving at us. And I'm unmuted. And, uh, I am here. Okay. If we could have the introduction of our translator, please. Good evening, board. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Verónica Arabs Navarro. Angélica Benítez y yo seremos las intérpretes en español de esta noche. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la mesa directiva. Esta reunión está siendo transmitida por el canal en español de Zoom. Para escuchar esta sesión en español, oprime el botón que dice interpretación en la parte inferior de su pantalla y seleccione el idioma de español. En este menú también puede seleccionar la opción de silenciar el audio original en inglés. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Then we have the Pledge of Allegiance next, uh, Dr. Kim. Good evening, everybody. If you please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, thank you. Next. Next on the agenda is um, our district mission and vision statements. So the mission of Santa Clara Unified School District is to provide equitable, engaging, and innovative educational experiences so that each student thrives in a global society. And the vision is that graduates of Santa Clara Unified School District are resilient, future-ready, lifelong learners who think critically, solve problems collaboratively, and are prepared to thrive in a global society. Okay, for our agenda tonight, uh, I want to make just a little change to swap items D and C um, because I wanna resume the open session before we start the study session instead of after. So um, that's just a minor change. Are there any other changes to the agenda? Okay, can I have a motion to approve, please? Motion to approve, Lieberman. Second, Fairchild. All righty, we have a motion uh, from Trustee Lieberman, a second from Trustee Fairchild. And because we have uh, Trustee Ryan remote, we'll be doing everything by roll call tonight. So Trustee Canova. Sorry, Trustee Canova. Yes. Thank you. Trustee Fairchild. Yes. Trustee Gonzalez. Yes. Trustee Lieberman. Yes. Trustee Ratterman. Yes. Trustee Ryan. Yes. And I also say yes. yes. So that passes. Yes. Uh, seven to zero. Yes. Great. Okay, we are um, yes. going to go into closed session. And in closed session, we will be talking about B.1, Government Code Section 54956, Conference with Legal Counsel on Existing Litigation. Item B.2, Conference with Real Property Negotiators on the Youth Activity Center. Item B.3, Public Employee Discipline, Dismissal, Resignation, Reassignment, and Release. Item B.4, Public Employee Empl Appointments. B.5, Conference with Labor Negotiators, and B.6, Public Employee Performance Evaluation. Uh, at this time, uh, we can have uh, public comment on our closed session items. So uh, look in the room. There's nobody in the room who wishes to speak. I will open it up to the Zoom. If there's anyone on the Zoom who wishes to speak, nope, nobody. Okay, great, then we will... Um, be heading into closed session and uh, we will resume uh, when 
we come back. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. So welcome back to the February 10th regular board meeting of the Santa Clara Unified School District Board of Trustees. We, um, in closed session, we had um, for item B.1, no update. Oh, sorry, you know what? I need to introduce the translator first. Can we, can we do our translator first? <laughs> Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Angelita Benítez. Verónica y yo vamos a hacer las intérpretes en español de esta noche. Bienvenidos a esta reunión. Esta reunión está siendo transmitida en el canal en español de Zoom. Para escuchar esta sesión en español, oprime el botón que dice interpretación en su pantalla y seleccione el idioma de español. En este menú también puede seleccionar la opción de silenciar el audio original en inglés. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so now back to the report from closed session. Item B.1, we had no update. Item B.2, we received information. Item B.3, we received information and gave direction to the superintendent to settle a post-employment benefits agreement. B.4, we received information. B.5, we received information. And B.6, we um, will continue uh, after the open session. We're gonna go back into closed session to complete that item. So we'll report out at the end. Okay, item uh, E.1, the report from the superintendent. Dr. No, Kemp, no, no. sorry. Study oh, session. sorry, study session. It was out of order. Oh yeah, okay, let's do our study session now. So this is item C.1, grading for equity. We have our special guest. <laughs> we'll just skip right past it. And um, Joe, I'm assuming that you're going to present and then um, there'll be an opportunity for public comment after uh, we present and maybe have a little discussion. Are you, are you, is this going to be interactive or is it just going to be a presentation? And please turn on the mic. It's a button on the bottom there. This is going to be, it's working. Um, this is going to be a presentation. Um, it's going to be about a half hour long. And then we're going to hear from um, a teacher who's been doing the work in the district. Uh, I don't know if there's another speaker after that. And then it'll be open for questions from the board. I think that's a design. Is that all right? Yes, okay. yeah, that's fine. And there was also uh, one public comment written that got um, passed out. So you should have it at your uh, desk in front of you. All right. Okay, please proceed. Great. Thank you. Well, it's good to be back. Um, in case you don't recall, um, I was here uh, back in November um, when we had sort of the first half of the study session around what is equitable grading and really the why of equitable grading. Um, what we didn't get to is the what. Um, and so today I'm gonna be able to spend a little bit of time talking about the what and a little bit of the how, how um, Santa Clara Unified is approaching this work, how they're thinking about it, how it fits in with what districts are doing across the country. Um, and then you'll hear from one of the practitioners who's doing the work. All right, so with that, um, yeah, as I just said, that's the agenda. So again, just a refresher of me. Uh, I'm a former high school English and American history teacher. I was a principal. I uh, worked in the central office in Union City in New Haven Unified, as well as in New York City. And um, in 2018, my book, Grading for Equity, was published. And since then, and actually prior to then, um, I, we've been working, me and my organization, and a team of educators have been partnering with schools and districts, um, as well as in, uh, independent schools, charter schools, large school districts, small rural, suburban, urban, um, ones uh, co community colleges, as well as universities and nonprofit organizations like the AFT, um, to support teachers in this work to help make their grading more equitable. Oops, I am going back. Okay, so um, as you may remember in the last session, I talked about why grading. There's a whole lot to tackle um, as a teacher and as a board and as a district and um, talked about how even though grading is considered to be really just kind of this coda at the end of a long symphony of teaching and learning, uh, in fact, it's woven into every pedagogical decision that a teacher makes. Um, whenever they ask a student to do anything, they have to decide, am I gonna grade this or not? And unfortunately, teachers have gotten very little training in how to grade. Um, they base their grading um, because they don't have much formal training and access to the research on grading. They base it and they have no choice but to base it on their own experiences. How was I graded as a student? 
and then they replicate that, or they look to what their department chair says, you've got to do 40% for homework, et cetera. And so this work is about helping bolster that aspect of their considerations as they decide how to grade. And it's also an issue, not just a pedagogical one, but it's important in terms of equity. Um, because uh, the, let's see what I've got up here. Yes, um, we are using a grading system that has been in place for a hundred years and is essentially fossilized from a hundred years ago and it has embedded within it certain belief systems and ideas and structures and intents that were important to us and were our best thinking, uh, some of our best thinking a um, hundred years ago. But now we recognize that those, we no longer believe those and the research contradicts many of those ideas on which they were based. And by continuing to use our traditional grading practices, we are actually perpetuating achievement and opportunity disparities without us realizing it. We can have the most um, thoughtful pedagogical approaches and most diverse curriculum and most SC, uh, strongest SEL work and undermine it all with the way that we grade if we don't change it. And our traditional grading system is actually undermining it in two ways. The first is that it is rewarding students with privilege and resources and punishing those without. And it's actually making it harder for students who have less privilege and resources from becoming successful. And in the last session, we looked at the history. I'm not gonna go into it today. Um, we looked at the history and, and talked about why of all possible universes of grading systems, do we have this one uh, and its impact on our work. And we talked about the industrial revolutions ideas and how um, important some of those were like that there's fixed intelligence and there's some people who just aren't smart and never will be. The idea that schools should sort students and not let them decide what they want to do, but tell them what they're going to do. And that we motivate students through rewards and punishments and reward people with rewards and punishments and that's effective. And those three ideas are no longer hold any water in research or in how we think about what our purpose of education is. And by continuing to use these practices, we're actually hurting our most vulnerable students and making it hard for us to do our job as educators. And there were three, uh, I may have talked about four, three or four big ideas that are happening, three uh, ways in which our traditional system is negatively impacting our work as educators. The first is that grading is this commodity. You hear students talk about how I'm two points away from an A. Why did I only get four points? I should have gotten six points and they're haggling over grades. That's all they talk about. We bemoan that they are not talking about learning, that they're only talking about the numbers. And yet we have taught that to them. We taught it to them in around third, fourth grade. There's no reason why we have to teach it to them. We are just using traditional ways of grading that's making them talk like that. The second big idea is that we're, at, we're actually constraining our communication and misleading our students in their understanding of what they know. And we're misleading caregivers and our own system in understanding where students are. Um, we are collapsing so much diverse information into a tiny little grade that we can have the student who does, has amazing understanding of content, but turns in everything late, get the identical grade as a student who doesn't quite know the content very well, but turns in everything on time. And why in the world will we have the same grade represent two totally different profiles of students? Well, it's the only choice we've had because it's the system we've inherited. And because of that, as well as teachers getting very little training, is that grades are becoming, grades become variable in which one teacher's class has a certain way of grading and the same course might have a different teacher doing different grading practices. And therefore you could have a student with identical performance getting two different grades based on the grading practices of their teacher. And this is not, this is no fault of the teacher because we haven't had access to the research and access to been invested in to better understand what the history is and how to grade more fit more accurately with less bias and with more sort of intrinsic motivation strategies. And therefore what is happening by continuing to use these traditional grading practices and the variable grading that results is that we actually have inaccurate and unreliable information about where students are in their learning. And therefore when we make decisions in our resources we may be likely misallocating them to the wrong students or not giving them to the students who should be receiving them. So students are on the athletic field who shouldn't be and students should be, but aren't. 
for example. And finally, the harm to students, that students internalize deeply what the grade is because a grade is including so many different aspects of them, they internalize that the grade is about them, not about their learning right now, but who they are as people. And it is a lifelong memory that students have of teachers and the ways that they've been graded. And we actually in this work can help detach those two ideas. So students understand that the grade is just a reflection of where they are in their learning, not who they are. So now the good stuff, what's better, which I didn't get to last time and here we go. So grading has three pillars when it's equitable. It is an accurate reflection of a student's academic performance. It is bias resistant. So we counteract institutional biases and we prevent our implicit biases from infecting our grade. And we make our, excuse me, our grades motivational. We build intrinsic motivation and sense of efficacy. And there's a tremendous amount in this. It's very complex. And I'm just dancing on the surface for you today in this short time we have. But I'm gonna take an example of a traditional grading practice and talk about why it's inequitable and how an alternate practice is more equitable. And the practice I'm gonna use as an example is averaging performance over time. So let's say I I'm teaching a unit, I'm a ninth grade English teacher, which I was, and let's say I'm teaching writing a persuasive essay and I got two students, let's say I got Kate and Sam, all right? Kate, from the very beginning, we've had five essays in this unit. Kate has gotten A minus A, 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 we average her performance, and of course it's an A. For Sam, he starts with a D, and then gets a D plus, and then gets a B minus, and then gets a B, and then gets an A. What we traditionally do is we average performance over time for him. So we take that D, D plus, B minus, B, A, and average it together and get a C. There's a couple problems with that. The first is that he never actually wrote a C level essay. But when we average performance over time, we're collapsing the whole range of his performance into a single letter. And in this case, describing his performance at essay writing that he never actually performed at. The second problem is that if I sat down, Kate and Sam, and I had to say whether or not they each have learned to write a high quality persuasive essay, they both have. So why in the world would I describe Sam's proficiency at writing an essay as a C? if he in fact has learned how to write a high quality essay. So when we use traditional grading practices, we warp the accuracy of the grade. And you may have questions about that and I'm sure you do. But I will also say why, why we want our grades to be bias resistant. So we want to counteract institutional biases in grading. Let me just see if I got, yes. And I wanna talk about what an institutional bias is. An institutional bias is when there are structures or systems that reward certain groups or punish others. So this is not when individuals are doing this, this is when the structures and systems are doing this. And in our grading, we wanna counteract these institutional biases. We wanna make sure that we don't reward students with privilege and resources and punish those who don't have them. And we wanna recognize that there are many students who have fewer supports and have been more systemically denied access to successful experiences and who have negative experiences with schools and other institutions of power. There are students who are ready to be harmed by schools because they felt it in other aspects of their lives as well. And you may say, well, that's, I get that, Joe, but how, what in the world does that have to do with averaging performance? Because averaging just seems like a calculation. So, Let's say I have Kate who's had that, the A's, A minus A's. And let's say we wind back the clock and we see that the summer before ninth grade, she enrolled in a summer writing program at the local community college. She had no idea how to write a persuasive essay, but she was in a great program because her parents could get her there, they could pay for it. She didn't have other responsibilities. And she learned how to write a persuasive essay. And then she walks into my class and does great. And so I average her performance over time, right? I'm not averaging her performance over all time. I'm averaging it just over when she was in my classroom. Sam, by contrast, didn't go to that summer writing program, couldn't afford it. Caregivers didn't know about it, had to work, had to take care of younger siblings, whatever. He comes into the class and of course he doesn't know how to write the essay, but he learns how to do it. 
Traditionally, when we average performance over time, we take all the disparities that are happening outside our classrooms and we're bringing them in. And what we're doing is we're saying we're gonna make it easier for kids like Kate and we're gonna make it harder for kids like Sam. And when we are more equitable, when we are uh, counteracting institutional biases, we say it doesn't matter that some kids had more resources and advantages outside the school and some didn't. What only matters is what do you have, what have you learned to do while you're in my classroom? The third uh, pillar is around motivation, right? We wanna build intrinsic motivation. So when I described Sam just now getting the D minus and then working his way up, that's actually the best possible story, right? A lot of times, he gets the first essay and he's like, I know the math. I, because we're averaging performance over time, I'm gonna have to do Herculean effort and work all my way up. And even if I have wonderful performance by the end, I still have this anchor over my, that I'm dragging with me because you're averaging performance over time. So a lot of students will say, well, forget it. Like, what's the point? And that happens at many different times over the semester where a student is just mathematically out of the game because we average. When we look at most recent performance, we say to Ellis, it doesn't matter that you didn't do well at the beginning. What only matters is, did you learn how to do it by the end? And in that way, we not only motivate him intrinsically, but we actually align the way that we grade with our beliefs about growth mindset. We say to students, make a lot of mistakes. That's wonderful. We love mistakes. And yet our traditional grading practices contradict this because we penalize kids like Sam from those mistakes that he made because that grade is something that's averaged in his performance. When we look at only the most recent performance, we actually have stronger motivation for students to succeed. These are a couple of quotes by um, some researchers. The first is by Geneva Gay, who's written about cultural sustaining pedagogy for a long, long time, and writes about how each failure by a student confirms what they already know about the task, that they can't do it. And we also know that instead of um, prompting greater effort, low grades more often cause students to withdraw from learning. I think traditionally we feel, as extrinsic motivation tells us, you just, like with the rat in the cage, you electrify the floor to get that rat to press this lever. And we know from overwhelming research that that does not motivate students who are struggling. And as I said, now we align grading when it's more equitable with the way that we talk about growth mindset and mistakes. These are just a couple of quick quotes by teachers. One kid started late in the class, was scoring low, was playing catch up. For the first time, I was giving him hope that he could still pass. And it makes a huge difference when you have hope. Uh, kids who have hope in the classroom, they don't give up and it changes the dynamic. So those are the pillars. That was a crash, crash, crash course. Um, and that was just one of the practices. And there are tons of questions that teachers ask around this practice. Like, well, what if it doesn't go up? What if it goes up and down? And what, all kinds of things. And there's lots of ways to tackle this. But it is helping teachers dislodge themselves and open up the opportunity and possibility for them to access research and better and align their grading practices with their deeper beliefs about teaching and learning. Ultimately, more equitable grading practices is where the grade does not include things like the zero to 100 scale and participation in behaviors and their performance on homework and other formative assessments and group grades and extra credit. And instead, the grade is reflective of the student's academic understanding through strategies like having explicit learning outcomes and rubrics and make this work, retakes and redos, whoops. again, retakes and redos and using the zero, excuse me, zero to four scale and formative feedback. So now very quickly, I wanna talk about what uh, districts have found as they progress through this work. We find that across different contexts, um, regardless of urban, suburban, rural, middle school, high school, college, the same things happen over and over, which is that for students, there's a reduction in grade inflation and there's a reduction in grade deflation at the same time. So students aren't getting all the points, 
for doing some of the non-academic things that they've gotten points for, and they're not getting penalized for not doing them, and a reduction in achievement disparities. And what we also find is even though I am not an unabashed lover of standardized exams, we find that the teacher assigned grades and the standardized test scores become more closely correlated. And I'd rather have them more closely correlated than farther away and we find they get closer. So I'm assuming that the slide deck up here is quite a bit different than this one. Yes. Okay, because I gave up a little while ago trying to follow along. Uh -huh. Thanks. Yeah, it's just- These should match, I think. I have trouble reading that, so I'm- Ah, uh, okay, me too. <laughs> Thank you, sorry for interrupting. Um, for students, um, teachers report to us and the students tell us that they're actually more motivated and have more hope. Um, they are less stressed. They talk about how they feel less stressed in their classrooms and they're not so focused on point accumulation. They talk about um, where they are in their learning by the language of the discipline. So they don't say, I'm two points away from an A. They say, if I can just apply negative exponents to the distributive property, I'll have an A, which is music to at least the math teacher's ears. Um, we, some of us don't know what that's talking about. Um, and the relationships actually get better with teachers through this work. For teachers, they talk about how this is very difficult. Um, it challenges many of the things they, have, they thought they knew. Um, but very early in the work, they have a they grow in their confidence around the accuracy of their grading. They don't argue with students and their caregivers nearly as much. The classrooms feel less stressful to them. And they can actually spend time on curriculum design rather than spending as much time entering sort of daily data. So how do we do this? Well, we know that there's a common solution which is actually not a good one. The common solution to this is where and a, a policymaking body or an administrator at a site or at a district central office will say, I got it, let's do this and just change his policy by fiat. And teachers push back pretty hard um, for lots of important reasons, which is that it, it deprofessionalizes the importance of their own learning. And that grading is so interwoven into instruction that it's important to not just make the change and think like that will solve it because it also creates inconsistency and confusion about what it all means and why. That instead, what we've seen in all of these kinds of districts, they approach this as a combination of bottom up and top down or sort of with no pejorative connotation, right? They start, they wanna think about how do we build the capacity of teachers to better understand and apply and experience more equitable grading practices in their own context with administration and policymaking groups creating the space and the structure for them to do this. And there's lots of different ways that districts do this and lots of opportunities for teachers to learn. But ultimately it's this policy practice dance where teachers are given the opportunity to try different practices collect evidence of the results and share with colleagues so that the, the district develops a body of evidence in their context about the benefits of the practices, which then inform policy changes. And then policy can start to pull some of the teachers in a direction or start to give some tailwind, then moves other teachers to create new evidence, generate new evidence that helps push policy. And it just goes back and forth down this road. And the idea is, that you start with a small group and start to build momentum and an evidence base and interest and excitement around those benefits and then can expand the people who are um, involved and can access the, the experiences. So what happened so far in this district is that there's been a cohort, as I believe you know, of teachers who have been doing this work in a, in a very formal professional development learning design where there was a launch and a two day kickoff in workshops that they've had over the course of the year. And they are conducting action research where each teacher is choosing a practice to try, collecting qualitative and quantitative data around the results and then sharing with colleagues. Each teacher is also getting individual coaching from a teacher in another part of the country who is 
often in their discipline and is, and is experienced in their practices. In addition, this district has really um, done a uniquely comprehensive approach where they are finding ways to connect with lots of constituents and lots of uh, roles within the system, including site administrators. Um, we have interviewed students or in the process of interviewing students and processing the data, having presentations to families for education and connecting with leadership pretty regularly um, to keep each other informed about what's happening. All right, I think that's, oh, I'm gonna give you one last quote of a teacher and then I'll connect you to one of your own. Um, this has pushed me and all the teachers to be more equitable and transparent. Students at the same school should have the same grading system, be able to understand that system and know ex exactly how it supports learning. So excuse my little hiccups and uh, whew, I'm exhausted. Anyway, thanks for listening. I hope I kept your attention enough. Now for the real show. Hello, <laughs> my name is Sarah Silverman. I teach English at Santa Clara High School. Um, thank you for inviting me here tonight um, to talk about equitable grading. I am so pleased to be working for a district that's doing this work and helping us support our students. Um, I'll start by saying that I wish I had Joe's training when I started my career 12 years ago. Um, I learned about equitable grading the hard way. My first teaching post was at a Title I school. Um, since no one, as Joe said, sits down with new teachers, as Joe said, <laughs> he took my speech actually, um, you do what was done to you. So for the first two years of my teaching career, I gave inequitable zeros based on the zero to 100 scale. I didn't accept late work. Um, and half of my students failed. Not proud of that, but that is what happened with those policies. Um, it wasn't until I got to know my students and I got to know their struggles that I changed my policies. I have, and still to this day, so many students who, it, he stole my speech, <laughs> are go home, take care of little kids, all afternoon are working to help support their families. Um, we have to help them. Not all of them have a quiet space to do homework at night. Um, so my first change personally, and this was years ago, was accepting late work. Um, I used to walk around at the start of every day and stamp homework. And uh, you probably all remember that horrible, awful sinking feeling of not having your homework, right? I do and um, how that shame kind of sits with you for the whole rest of the period, maybe even for the rest of the day. Um, after I just, this is just one small change, right? Started accepting late work. My classroom transformed. Um, I walked around and stamped. They looked up at me and said, "Miss Silverman, I forgot my homework. And I looked at them and I smiled and I said, you don't have your homework yet. And then they'd smile back, they'd breathe, right? And then they'd be engaged for the rest of that class and with me. And eventually the work comes. Um, this year as part, of the group, as part of the cohort, with the support, I've been able to fully go on to standards-based grading. It's still a work in progress. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, I still don't fully understand all of it, but I'm working towards it. Um, but I know this, uh, when we use equitable grading practices, we show our students that we care about them. Um, and also accurate grade book, pretty, pretty amazing. Um, but the magic is this, uh, they start caring back. Thank you for having me. Good evening, Dr. Kemp, Executive Cabinet, Board President Muirhead, Trustees Fairchild, Lieberman, Canova, Gonzalez, and Ratterman. Uh, my name is Mike Steer, and I'm a Vice Principal of our Curriculum and Instruction at Wilcox High School. 
Um, tonight, I'd like to share with you my experience and observations regarding Wilcox High School's work around equitable grading practices. I should acknowledge a couple of biases at the outset of my comments. The first is I would be characterized as an early adopter regarding this topic. As an educator and a leader, I fundamentally believe that this is some of the most important work we can engage in to facilitate structural and measurable change for all students. The second is that I'm new to Wilcox and Santa Clara, Fied, Santa Clara Unified this year. In the process of researching, applying, and interviewing for positions in the Bay Area, I was looking for school districts that were engaged in this type of work. Standing in front of you now, I cannot adequately express the excitement and humility I felt upon being offered the opportunity to work here. I don't envy the position that you're in. As the public sounding board for every fact and feeling regarding these complex issues, I'm certain that you are inundated with varying perspectives of students, parents, teachers, administrators, and other experts. My goal tonight is simply to share a fraction of the thoughts and experiences that teachers and students have gone through since August. Currently, Wilcox has a cohort of 13 teachers and one counselor um, spanning five different academic departments engaged in this work. Um, now, I would never presume to speak for these teachers and students, but here are some of the anecdotes and observations I'm going to share with you. So teachers are implementing a variety of strategies from abolishing homework entirely and focusing on practice towards an assessment to frequent retakes or revisions of assessments with the goal of demonstrating greater understanding of the standards to issuing no mark in a grade book lower than 50%. One teacher reported that in shifting the evaluation of work to rubrics, that the teacher noticed it shifted the conversation with students away from grades into the standards and that the discourse became more academically focused. Students are engaged in more conversations connecting classwork to homework to assessment. And there is evidence that they're making connections on how each impact each other and overall learning. Students admitted to having to reorient them, their own mindset around work completion and assessment. In conversations with students, they've remarked that they're not used to being offered as many retakes or revisions with such regularity, and that at first it was difficult for them to understand why or the importance. Personally, as a continually involving educational leader, I see the shift to equitable, equitable grading practices vital to the future of public education. At its core, it promotes learning over grading, emphasizing standards or skills-based assessment, the use of rubrics, proficiency scales, calibration, all of which creates a transparency of learning from teacher to student. Imagine if you will, a classroom where students didn't ask, what's my grade? Can I earn any extra credit? Have you graded my work yet, right? And instead said, what are we learning today? Where can I go to, to learn more about this topic? Can we go over my revisions? How can I improve? There's a visual graph, which Mr. Feldman referenced that stuck with me the first time I went through one of his trainings back in Santa Barbara, where you have a student flatline earns an A and a student with a learning arc who ends up with a C but they, their, last, their destination is the same spot. I was left wondering with both students who demonstrated proficiency on the standard, but earning a different mark, what were we telling these two students? What did that demonstrate about what we value as an institution? Finally, I would like to speak to you as a parent of two children beginning their journey in the public school system. Between my partner and I, we have collectively worked in the public schools for 33 years, serving in a variety of roles from paraeducator to special education teacher, school psychologist, vice principal, principal, and district level administration. There is little doubt in my mind that they will have every possible advantage in navigating the system to their benefit. They will also be at a terrible disadvantage if they ever try to get away with anything. But unfortunately, this knowledge and experience leaves us in the place as parents of knowing that in the current construct of evaluation and grading, the future marks our children will receive will be little more than a reflection of their ability to play the game of school. An A in any class will tell us no more or less about what they know, understand, and are able to do in relation to state standards and frameworks than a mark of a B, a C, a D, or an F. Systems that allow for or emphasize equitable grading practices shift the narrative from achievement to learning. They leave room for growth over time and understanding that no two students, 
let alone 35 master a concept at the same time. My two sons didn't demonstrate the ability to walk or talk at the same intervals. And the reality is that regardless of the skill, they never will. As a former special education teacher, aspiring principal and parent, it's my hope that the system that I work in and my children participate in will embody these qualities. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much. Again, I appreciate being invited back to continue the conversation. And now the questions are yours and they can be for me or for the teacher or administrator. Sorry to volunteer you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, just for the people in the room, just so you know, Trustee Ryan is on the, the Zoom, so she's listening in um, also. And uh, I'll open it up to the board questions, uh, Trustee Canova, and then Trustee Ratterman. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for the great presentation, because last time you didn't have that opportunity to, to get to where you went tonight. Really appreciate the comments. What I, I really do like about this, what I'm really attracted to, is, uh, you know, we're in Silicon Valley where we have so many examples in Silicon Valley's history of individuals who started and failed multiple businesses, personal bankruptcies, corporate bankruptcies, and then they strike gold and they become some of the wealthiest people on the planet. And, and I think what that shows us is that failure is an incredible teacher. We shouldn't be afraid of failure. We should embrace it. Uh, nothing will get your attention more than failure. And the lessons you learn from failure really build you for the future. So failure is a friend, not an enemy. And I really like some of these things here that kind of address that. The standard scales in terms of the gradations of mastery, I love that. That I think that kind of syncs with that thinking. Um, the retakes and the redos syncs with that thinking. Uh, the one thing I need a little help on, and you know, maybe I'm not getting the messaging, but the zero to 100 scale versus the zero to four scale. Could you tell me why the zero to four is superior? Uh, all right, so here's a mini lesson. Um, so the zero to four scale, the standard scale is a 90s and A, B is a, uh, excuse me, 90s and A, 80s a B, 70s a C, 60s a D is a 50 is an F. Um, actually, an F is zero to 59 is an F, right? So if you think about the scale sort of visually, zero to 59 is an F. So that means that 60% of the scale or two thirds of the scale almost are to describe gradations of failure. And a third of the scale is to describe gradations of success, or maybe for many, it's even a fifth of the scale, right? So we are, first of all, we're sending kind of a weird message to students that we value failure so much that we want to have 70 gradations of it to describe. We want to distinguish a 14 from a 19, from a 26, from a 34, from a 41, et cetera. And only those numbers of the gradations of success. The second problem is that it's actually disproportionately oriented toward failure because the design of it allocates a disproportionate of the, the space of the numbers towards low, uh, a low performance. It pulls all the grades down particularly when they're disproportionately low. So for example, if I turn, if I get a B, B and an F and I had to average a B, B and an F, I would say, well, that's like a C minus or something like that, just on its face. However, if I take an 85 and 85 and a zero, the average of that is a 57, which is an F. So an average of a B, B and an F is an F in our zero to 100 scale. So because the scale is disproportionately oriented toward failure, it's gonna pull down grades disproportionately when they're of low performance. Plus, nobody uses zero to 100 scale in most of the elementary, and it doesn't happen in college because they curve everything. So we are introducing a scale that they will never use again. It's not used on driver's license, bar exams, no, no demonstration of competence in any field uses a zero to 100 scale, but we use it in grades six to 12. And because of the mathematical unsoundness of the scale, and sort of pedagogical, lack of pedagogical justification, we are disproportionately making it harder for students who have an intermittent failure, right? One zero is like the atomic zero, and it so um, is catastrophic in the mathematics of the grading. And a zero to four scale has an equal allocation, right? It's zero, one, two, three, four. It's the GPA scale. Or some teachers use a minimum 50, it was referenced, right? 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. So now you have proportional um, bands of the grades. 
and it, it stops the disproportionate um, punishing aspect of the zero to 100 scale. That was a quick, quick description with no visuals. It was very hard. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. But that was good. Uh, Trustee Ratterman. Yeah, and so I'm going to apologize. I read the whole book because I thought that was easier than doing it chapter at a time. Well, I guess I did read it chapter at a time, but I read all of them. Um, and so some of these questions may be out of turn. But um, so when I read through it, there were some things that were instantly worked for my paradigms. I agreed with them. I agree with the idea that the most recent knowledge is the one you should be grading upon. Not It doesn't matter how quickly you acquire it. Just as long as you get it at the end, I think that maybe means I'm a little bit in the Paulo Ferreri's banking model, but I'm not going to worry about uh, pedagogy of the whatever. Um, the other thing that worked well for me was the redos capacity. I think you should be able to, if I even suggest, I think a one minute manager, uh, primary goals, Blanchard, one of the things they talked about was doing was giving them a test, having them retake the test until they get it right. Just make sure everything that they're supposed to know is on the test. And then if they get it, can get all the answers right, they know everything they're supposed to know. So I, I think that the opportunity to redo for a lot of reasons works well with me. I actually think zeros are fine so long as the zeros are appropriate to absolutely knowing nothing, um, which is very difficult to acquire. Um, the thing that does bother me, just like Jim, the one to four, I think that's very easy to slide into that becoming a, a percentage equivalent to ABCD. I understand the part about the zero to 50. So, um, you know, and I also see the other side of that argument where it says, okay, there should be a certain level of competency there so if you don't get, if you only, if you're only learning half the material, 50%, you know, you really don't have it. So I think there's probably a, a shifting, but I don't see the one, two, three, four, other than maybe a psychological, this is new, fresh, different. And so I'd like to know more about the one to four. Um, and I think that's, I'm probably out of time here. So let's do the, I'd love, oh, the other thing is I'd like to know is what you feel the differences between this and standards-based grading is. I think that's a huge one for me. So if you could just highlight the big differences, I don't need to know the similarities but the differences. Uh, I'll do them in reverse order. Um, so the primary difference between equitable grading practices and standards-based grading practices is including the historical context and the moral imperative. So standards-based grading is framed really as a pedagogically valuable tool, and it is, it's incredibly important. Equitable grading um, brings to that the lens of history and looking at how the inherited system that we have is actually disproportionately punished our historically underserved kids. And it also, what we find it actually, because it, it, it addresses and incorporates that, it brings a stronger motivation of teachers actually to stick with this because they see that it isn't just like one more pedagogical initiative. It's actually makes their classrooms fair and addresses some of the inequities that have been in schools for a long, long time. That's the, that's the difference. So it sounds like if you're already in a standards base, the transition to equity base would be far smaller than a normal transition. Absolutely, what you would do is you would actually just bring your lens of equity to it to examine whether it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. Um, one to four. So the, what I, is just wonderful is you are actually saying the same discussions that teachers go through, right? What is the difference between a one to four? Cause it's just gradate, it's just the, I can translate it into the zero to 100 scale. It's just an academic thing, or it's just the GPA scale. It's just a numbers thing, but it's not. What teachers start to understand as they go further in this work is that a zero, one, two, three, four, the four is actually a descriptor of a level of understanding. So if I asked you, what's the difference between a student in an English nine class who gets a 96 versus a 95? What's the difference? The only thing you could say is that it's 1% difference. But if I have fewer gradations and now I tie those gradations to actual levels of understanding, what is the difference between a student who gets an A in English nine and a student who gets a B in English nine? That's much more qualitatively um, easy and, and relevant to describe the differences. What it also does is it stops students from saying, oh my gosh, I have a 97, I got, how can I get 100? How can I get 100? With fewer gradations, you actually relieve students of the stress and the, the dog eat dog competition of trying to get higher because there's always something higher, right? If you have excellent understanding, 
you have excellent understanding. That's it. You That's it. Decimal to one side of your one, two, three, four. You can. You, can. you can. Some teachers do. They use a GPA scale where they'll add like a 3.7 is an A minus, right? You can add some gradations, but you're not adding 10 of them, right? There's no qualitative difference between a student who has a 3.6 and a 3.5. How would you describe the difference in adjectives or understandings of content? You can't because we've reduced learning to a measure end. And it's just an accumulation of points earned over points possible. And as long as we keep that in an abstract, numerically defined, quantitatively described level of achievement, we have detached learning from amassing points. And you can actually shift how students talk about it. They no longer say, can I get one more point? And you may not believe it's possible, but I'm telling you, even for those hardened high school kids, they totally change how they talk about learning. Trustee Lieberman. Um, thank you for this presentation. Um, I, um, what I like about this is that it instills a growth mindset in the kids. It, it makes them, it, it, I think it, it, it puts into perspective why they're in school. They're in school to grow and to learn. And the end result is mastery and an understanding of a concept. It You can get an A in something and not understand what you've learned. So, um, and, and so, um, you know, a lot of kids are just good test takers and they can memorize and, you know, barf it out on a piece of paper and they get an A and they have no, no real mastery of the skill. So for me, this, this practice ensures that you're actually teaching and the kids are getting it. So there's actual learning. Um, and I think to me, it's very um, equivalent to restorative justice practices um, in the sense that, um, you know, if, if you're punitive all the time with kids, they're done. Um, and so it, it, it kind of, you lose that reaching that child. And I think that the way grading for equity um, builds those kids up with the promise that they can't do it yet. And I love that word um, because I, and I use that with my own kids because it's so easy to feel like you're a failure because you didn't do well on one test uh, and I'm done. I'm, I can't get this, but they just don't get it yet. And I think that the growth mindset that this instills in kids is vitally important as they get older. Um, and the one thing I wanted to ask you about, um, and it's a huge peeve of mine, um, where a child has mastery, but the teachers have created a grading system that penalizes them for things that are not material. So like, um, you know, they didn't do the problem in the right order. So they take five points off. Um, and so you have a student that has mastery but they have a C because they didn't put their name in the right place and they didn't put the date before their name. Um, how, do you, how do you get teachers to remove that practice because it's punitive for punitive sake for me? Um, so how do, you, how do you work that out of the system? Yeah, I mean, the first thing is like, so teachers are only replicating how they were taught and, and they are trying to, um, create wonderful, successful kids in their classroom. And so they believe that by using grades as an extrinsic motivating strategy, it will actually improve student performance. That I will teach you to put your heading in the right place if I take off five points. Like that will actually work and will help you. So it's coming from the right place. The problem is that the research doesn't support that at all but teachers have never known that that's possible. So part of this work is just explaining to them, like, let's look at what the research says and let's look at actually what it does to your own grade, right? You can, like the example I gave, if a kid knew everything, but put the heading in the wrong place, they would have the same grade as a student who didn't know everything, but put it in the right place, right? And, and I think that it's helping teachers connect to what their sort of professional identity is, which is I am supposed to help students learn and I'm supposed to accurately describe where they are in their performance. And when they recognize that by putting all this stuff 
together, they're actually compromising their own integrity as an accurate communicator of student performance. They want to they wanna do something different and they want to know, how do I get the kid to put the heading in the right place? Because if I don't have the grade point, how do I get them to put it in the right place? And we talk about what are some other feedback strategies that you can utilize that actually build relationships with students. And you can say, I love it. You knew this whole thing. That's incredible. Next time, I'd really like it if you could put the heading here. Let's practice, right? So it just, right. It just changes the dynamic that happens, right? I'm not just, like you said, punitive. You're welcome. Trustee Fairchild. Thank you so much. Um, I had so many thoughts going through my head and I enjoyed um, starting your book. Um, one of them was a, 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 a family lore story of a relative of mine who walked into a class and asked how many assignments they didn't have to turn in to still get an A. Um, and we, we joke about that a lot. So one of the things that I, that wasn't touched on that I need, and maybe it's in the book, I haven't gotten there yet, is uh, how you described standards was their cumulative. And so that's not always the case. And so um, there are a variety of standards in each class. So it's not necessary, necessarily that a student will, we don't all just progress in essays. You know, we have a, a section in history on the Revolutionary War, and then we have a section on the Civil War, and we have a section, you know, we move up and, and they're different. So how do you address that, those different standards with the grading? Yeah, Y'all getting into all the weeds. All right. So um, just good questions. Yeah, no, okay. good questions. They're the same ones that come up all the time. Um, so, the, uh, so the example I gave was by a unit by on purpose, right? So yeah. teachers are thinking about this, not necessarily over the entire semester, because you're right, content is not, each standard is not entirely and only um, cumulative. So if I'm teaching in your example, you know, social studies or US history, when, my, when I do my unit on the civil war, I'm having some outcomes that I'm expecting. And on the first quiz, you might not do so well. The next quiz, you might do better. But by the end, in the final assessment, you've learned it. I don't include the earlier quizzes, right? Other teachers will say, well, there's actually some cumulative nature even in US history. So it may be that a student actually doesn't understand the full impact of the Civil War until after we've taught Reconstruction. And so I might actually assess their understanding of the Civil War in the Reconstruction assessment. And if a student has a deeper understanding of the Civil War when they study Reconstruction, I'm gonna overwrite how they did on the earlier content. Um, sometimes they're totally distinct and then you can just have it be self-contained within that unit. But I think it, it asks the teacher to think about more deeply what is the cumulative nature and what isn't, and then how do I address that in the way that I grade? I hope that, did that answer the question? Um, that, yeah, that's very, that's very helpful because that's where I could see an issue um, coming up is just that there are many standards in every class. Yeah, absolutely. And, and your example was very linear and, and sometimes it doesn't work that way. My next question and is about retakes and redos um, because there has to be some sort of a limit on the retakes and redos because there is only so much time in a teacher's day. And so I was just wondering what some of the policies were that have come up that have worked regarding retakes and redos. I mean, there are tons of them. So, I mean, you could have the teacher. I, mean, I would love to hear, yeah. Please come up to the mic. Thank you. This is something that we talk about a lot. This is something that I've played around with for many years. Um, where I'm currently at, say for my content. So I teach English, I teach English 9, I teach AP Lang, we have units, right? <laughs> and there are certain standards that we're covering in that unit. There are certain standards that are like power standards that are like citing evidence. When are we not citing evidence? That's everywhere, right? So it depends. And it's, and it's again, work in progress, right? Work in progress. These are all the questions we're asking too. So say in a unit, so I'm doing a unit on Romeo and Juliet, and I have certain standards that I'm covering for Romeo and Juliet. Um, 
I'm going to do exactly what Joe just said, which is I have my formative checks leading up to my summative. And yeah, and then there's homework assignments, you know, there's assignments, there's in class assignments, there's all sorts of stuff that may or may not go into my grade book. But, you know, in order to keep my sanity, uh, yes, there is a limit. Like it makes sense for students to redo the formative work up until the end of the unit, say. Mm -hmm. But when we're on to the next book, I don't really want them or need them going back to the Romeo and Juliet work, but I will allow them to retake that summative assessment or rewrite that essay as many times as they want, if that kind of gives you an idea. Yeah. And I'll just say that teachers do it in lots of different ways and they evolve in their thinking. Um, even to just show you how um, small or big this can get, this can get really small, like, well, I'm offering this second algebra test another time for those who want, you take it and if you do better, I replace. Or uh, we decide that we're gonna um, actually embed the retake into the subsequent exam. So half the, re half the next exam is gonna be content from the earlier. So that actually functions as a retake it can get even bigger where in world language in particular, teachers, if I get a C in Spanish one, but an A in Spanish two, some districts will overwrite Spanish one and say that Spanish one is an A because world language is so cumulative over the years that if I have an A level understanding of Spanish two, why wouldn't I be able to have an A in Spanish one simply because, I, and why wouldn't I have that simply because it took me longer to learn the content. So it can get really interesting and really get students focused on, I don't just have to learn and do well in this class, I actually have to learn the language. And if I demonstrate understanding of the language, my report card will, ref or my transcript will reflect my understanding of the language. Thank you so much. Uh, my last question for this time is around homework mm -hmm. because um, full disclosure, I'm related to five math teachers. So math is one where that practice is so important prior to that cumulative assessment. And so how do you manage the need for students to practice math, yet not penalize them for doing so like you're saying, so that they can definitely learn that content and perform well on the test because that practice is so important mm -hmm. when we're learning a lot of those math concepts. Yeah. So. That's one where I I can just feel my yes you can resistance on that homework and and grading that homework because it's so necessary for right. content mastery and that nervousness comes from a fear that if you don't include it in the grade students won't do it right but I want to tell you they actually will and that is a very difficult thing for teachers to recognize and then when they experience it they can't believe it that students will actually do homework without it being included in the grade. And what they do is they help students understand the relationship between the homework that they do and the performance on an assessment. Right now, students don't know that there's a relationship between those things because the only reason they're doing the homework is because someone is awarding them points for doing the homework. Nobody goes out and- I don't think there's the only, that's the okay. only reason. I mean, when we, we ask them, we're making huge generalizations here. I can okay. only go on with students who I've spoken with from your district. You're right. I can't, it, I can't speak. I haven't talked to all of them, but I will tell you that the reason why they copy homework and they all copy at one point or another, every student I've ever spoken with in every district I've ever worked in has said at some point they have copied. What's been interesting is what, when I ask why, and they tell me that they're doing it because if they don't complete it, they will lose points. So it is building a culture where I have to get points. I have to get the points, regardless of whether I stayed up till 11 o'clock because I had two soccer games. I got to take, I got to work. I don't feel good. I didn't understand it. It doesn't matter. I have to get the points. So it focuses students squarely on accumulating points, not learning. With the irony is that in every aspect of a student's life outside of school and homework, they understand the relationship between practice and performance. I go out and shoot free throws for an hour. Nobody is counting up the points I score and bring them to the game, right? When I perform in front of a mirror and I practice in front of a mirror, there's no applause, but I know that by practicing, I do better in the performance. We have detached those ideas often in our classrooms. And what this work is about is where we help students understand that the homework 
is not for the teacher, it is for the student. One of the wonderful things that happens is as students start to understand the correlation and causation between completing homework and doing well on assessments is that there is no more copying. So students, every time a teacher gets homework, they know it is only that student's work. There is, you've taken away the incentive for them to get a tutoring help, copying everything. So teachers now get entirely valid data around where students are in their learning because they've taken away the incentive to not have it show that. And then what students will do is they will then start to make decisions about how much of the homework they need to do. And they get better at self-assessing. Do I actually have to do all 30 problems in the math homework or can I do every four until I get stuck and then do them? So you start to build self-regulation skills in students, which is actually a much stronger skill set when they go beyond high school. You don't want them just doing stuff because someone told them to do stuff. You want them to identify when do I need to do things to help me perform at the level I want to perform at. And it's mind blowing for teachers. They cannot believe it. They cannot believe that it actually works. And every time it works. Thank you. Trustee Gonzalez. So I guess the, the question I would have is, uh, and just from uh, some ex an example that was basically a parent contacted me a few months ago as far as, you know, uh, this is harming her child or, or what have you, because now, you know, he has a B plus instead of the A because of some of the, these policies. So how do we get buy-in from parents? Obviously the staff, I think Ed, Ed Code kind of gives great latitude as far as, uh, I think in the past we were trying to uh, to change a uh, requirement from uh, for zeros to, to shall, you know, the students shall be able to do it versus the, the teacher may uh -huh. give this opportunity. So how do you get the buy-in from parents, the community, but also staff as well? Yeah, so for families, I mean, the, 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 for the families whose students have been historically underserved and often whose voices aren't exerting the same kind of pressure, at least overtly, um, they, are, they so appreciate these opportunities for their children who haven't had them because of the structures that have been in place. For the students whose families, uh, for, the, for the families of students who have been very successful in the traditional model, it causes a lot of anxiety or worry because you're changing the rules of a game that we're doing well at, right? And we figured out how to play. And I don't mean that sort of um, disparagingly, like it is a system that it has worked and they've done very well. What we've found to be the most helpful for those families is to say, we as a district actually have not been holding up a clear mirror to where your student is in their understanding. We have been giving you a foggy mirror. When your student hasn't necessarily known all the content, because they turned in all their homework, whoever, regardless of who did it, they have an A, right? And now we're actually gonna be clear so that we're more honest with them about where they are in their learning. And we have no doubt that your student will still get an A, right? But you can only change your performance if you have an accurate feedback. And now our feedback's gonna be a lot more accurate. Um, and that really is fine with them um, because you're not taking anything away. You're actually making it more accurate. Um, in terms of like developing board policy, I mean, the biggest advice is what I would say at the end is that you have to have enough evidence in the context so that it warrants and justifies changing policy. And some districts, I mean, this is a multi-year process. This is not one year, this isn't two year. This may not be three year, this may be a four year process because you've got to have enough opportunities for enough teachers to try them with enough support and collect that evidence so that you can build the case. And then districts will get you know, task forces that are accumulating evidence. Like what is all the evidence that's showing? It's not just teachers saying this will never work. It's like for the teachers who have done it and have collected evidence, what does the evidence say? And then basing their policies on the evidence in their own context. Thank you for that. I, I think I, you mentioned the top, the top down approach, the unilateral approach. And I think this is, if it's coming from the teachers, if they're seeing the benefit to this in their classrooms, in their grades, I think it's something that uh, it's much more, uh, palatable, I guess, for them to, uh, to accept, right? Something we can implement easier. Thank you. Okay, I think everyone's had a turn and I'd no. like to move on. So, no, 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 no. oh, no. is her hand up? I haven't seen her hand yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> now both are. Okay, she's waving. Okay, go ahead, trustee. So can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. 
Can you hear me? She can't hear us. <laughs> can you hear me now? You can hear me. Okay. So I just I really appreciate the presentation. Um, you know, the last time I was in a classroom teaching, I in the last few years, I totally transformed my system of grading. It mirrors this almost exactly with the one to four on, we actually, I actually broke it down by concept. I was a math teacher, broke it down by concept. Students got graded one to four with multiple opportunities to reassess. Um, I think if they show mastery, and I only graded, I only graded the concept quizzes. That was their only grade. We didn't grade homework. We actually replaced all the time we spent grading homework and checking homework with in-class practice. Um, which was great. Um, and I, I saw those changes. I saw those students being far more motivated in their learning and understanding that they could keep reassessing and learning the same kind of thing where maybe they didn't understand solving two-step equations the first time we assessed on it. But as we practiced more and more over the course of the semester, they did get it. And then they could go back and reassess. I eventually cut it off at the end of the semester when I had to submit a final semester grade. But I had students and, you know, side benefits of students who would often come in in my previous way of grading near the end of the semester saying, what can I do for extra credit? And my feeling was, I want you to master the content. Um, and this gave a way to say, we could look at kind of areas where they hadn't done so well and say, look, if you can bring that up to a four, uh, you had a two on it, you can bring it up to a four, but that's really going to boost your grade. Um, because you can demonstrate to me that you've mastered that concept. They actually had to master it twice on two different quizzes so that I could show that there was, uh, that content was, that mastery was retained over two, over two times. But it also made it easier in terms of math to say, you didn't show your work. So you got a right answer. I don't know how you got it though. So I can give you a, a, a one or a two for having the correct answer, but that's not enough to, to demonstrate mastery. It was, it was transformative for both me as a teacher and for my students. So um, I love to hear that we're moving in this direction. I totally um, appreciate all the comments from the teachers and the educators in our district who have seen this in action and see how have been able to see how it works and support the students. And I, I just, I, I'm, I'm really, really, I'm grateful that we're having this this conversation in our district because I've I've seen the transformative nature to teaching and learning by moving to a system of of more equitable grading. So thank you. Alrighty, and um, I'll just say, I really wish that we had this when my three kids were in school because they're way out of school at this point. And I still remember the discussions when they were in middle and high school, all about how to get their grade up. It was all about how to improve the grade. And it wasn't about what they're learning because they were learning and that wasn't where the focus was. And it was such a shame. So I, I really, really appreciate this work that's going on. Um, and I appreciated what you just said about the, the message to the parents, both the ones who kids have struggled in the past and the ones who, with kids who haven't, um, that there's benefits um, for everyone. Um, I wanted to kind of look at Dr. Kemp to say, so uh, we've gotten these presentations and I know there's this cohort going on and how is this moving out um, to the rest of our staff? I'm gonna have Mr. Stam come over and talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Good evening. And I want to acknowledge the leadership of our Director of Professional Learning, Karen Allard, and our Director of Secondary Ed, Matt Baldwin, as well in this work. Um, we just actually met with Joe uh, virtually uh, yesterday to talk about plans for next year. And what uh, we would like to do and we'll be proposing to the board is that we have a second cohort of teachers who are interested. Uh, we have representation from all of the secondary schools in the first cohort. And so we'll be looking as well, not only for teacher interest, but where there are departments that need engagement um, and also continuing to sustain our administrator professional development as well. And we'd like to invite some of our cohort one teachers to essentially do some work at their schools around engaging their colleagues in these very important discussions as well. So it's a diffusion of innovation strategy that we'll be using um, and the goal really is over a course of time is to build a critical mass of teacher champions and teachers who can 
convince their colleagues of the power of this. And then we'll also be looking at student data and student impact and student voice as well. Um, so we anticipate this to be a multi-year initiative. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I look forward to it moving forward because I'm wondering about what happens when you have some teachers doing this and other teachers not and, and students saying, oh, I want the easy teacher because they, you know, they grade, you know, this way and I'll get a better grade and how colleges and, you know, others will look at that. So it seems like this, this in between could be a little messy um, until we get broader buy-in. Do you have a comment about that, Mr. Feldman? That's a, a common concern, and I, I think um, I'm going to answer it with something that won't necessarily make you feel 100% better, but right now there is so much variability that's happening in the district that this is just variability. It is, <laughs> it is variability in the good direction and to trying to develop coherence as opposed to what it is right now, which is a lot of incoherence and variability. So it's actually moving in a good direction, although it feels like you've got two different systems operating at the same time. Can Got I, it. I can really appreciate that. Done. Can I ask a related question? Related question? Okay. Last one. Then we'll move on. Yeah, the last one is there are some ed code pieces. The ultimate goal would be to get the entire district on the system. So I believe there's some ed code provisions out there that make that challenging, particularly in the area of redos and retaking tests, that type of thing. How have you dealt with that? Is that a real, still a real problem or how does it, how other, have other districts dealt with it? What specific ed codes are you referencing with redos? Well, I would have, I'm pulling it out of memory, but we've had issues where um, teachers, the teacher, the code says something along the line of the teacher may offer a test mm -hmm. and it becomes a right of the teacher to be able to decide whether to do that or whether not to. Mm -hmm. As an administration, we don't have the authority to force it. So the question then becomes, if you've got a teacher who says, I don't want to do this, and I'm not going to give a redo, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Have you run into this at other districts? And if so, how have you resolved the issue? Yeah, I mean, I think the, ed, the, the sort of heart of the ed code uh, intent is that the teacher is actually the, the decider of what the grade is. They are in the best professional position to do that. They know their students the best and they know their content the best and they know their curriculum the best. So they are in the best, the, the highest professionally qualified position to assign the grade. What this is about is where teachers through a set of experiences develop a common understanding and agreements really. And some of it is even within and in um, coordination with union representation, where it's a recognition that there are higher quality practices that are from their colleagues, such that there come these agreements. Now, are they binding agreements? Probably not, but there are a lot of agreements that teachers make all the time with each other as professionals that we're going to do these units in a particular order, or we're going to use this particular assessment. And this falls in the same thing. We as professionals believe from our own evidence that this is a better practice, and we're going to agree that we're doing this practice. Sometimes schools will also structure retake blocks. So if you don't want to give a retake block, that's okay. We offer it for all students in English one. It doesn't have to be from you. We can do it this way too. But that so rarely happens because there's, the benefits are so clear and colleagues support it. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Alrighty. Thank you so much for coming uh, here tonight and working with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you again for the invitation. Great conversation, great questions. And thanks again to the district for such a being a great partner in this work. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kemp, is he coming back again or is this it for us? For this year, it is it. Yes. Uh, we will likely see Joe many more times as we continue to um, dive into this equity work. Great. Okay. And I'm, I'm getting through your book, so. We'll get there. <laughs> oh, good. I'm not graded on it. Okay. Thank you all so much for coming. We are moving on then. Next item is our superintendent report. So I turn it over to you, Dr. Kemp. Good evening. Well, this is hard to do. I'm trying to look at you this way. Good evening, trustees. My report um, hopefully will be short tonight as we have a lot to cover on the agenda, including uh, the COVID-19 update from staff. I'm opening my report tonight by sharing uh, my thanks to you, the board, for being a partner. Uh, the governance team, superintendent board work in partnership on behalf of the community and most importantly, Santa Clara Unified Students. 
when you engage in transformation work, like the study session this evening, um, you are engaging in, uh, in some challenges that we have uh, to deal with obstacles to overcome. And the change process is hard, uh, especially when there are long established systems in place, such as um, grading practices. So I appreciate the opportunity to uh, spend time with you this evening um, around this. I wanna thank the board for leaning into all the hard work that we're doing, not just with COVID, uh, but with the equity work and establishing and improving our systems, all with a focus on our vision and mission, which we read now before each board meeting. I wanna thank um, the board for partnering with me to listen and share what you hear in the community as the community approaches you with frustrations and requests and ideas um, and concerns that they raise. Uh, thank you for sharing our message and our resources and for sending those issues to me so I can address them with our outstanding team of leaders and educators that we have here to ensure that our students thrive. I would like to recognize uh, the National School Counseling Week and the National School Bus Driver Appreciation Day. Uh, National School Counseling Week is February 7th through 11th. It's sponsored by ASCA. Uh, this Re recognition week highlights the tremendous impact of school counselors can have in helping students achieve school success and plan for a career. And I can attest that my daughters had amazing high school counselors who um, became beloved family friends uh, because of their support to our daughters. And I attest that my daughter, Julia, uh, is who she is because her high school counselor recognized her and sent her off to um, Pepperdine's uh, Leader Institute one summer. And that changed her trajectory. The National School Driver, um, School Bus Driver Appreciation Day is February the 22nd. It is a recognition day that shines the light on our wonderful bus drivers who are always there to make sure that our students go to and from school activities safely and on time. And I look forward to the day when I can ride that school bus again on Monday morning with our students uh, and find my little friend who probably now is a second grader uh, from the um, from Jim's neighborhood. She would. We always talked whenever I rode the bus. Um, so I'd like to invite you to join us in celebrating and sharing uh, your messages of thanks on your favorite social media. And don't forget to hashtag us, hashtag SCUSD proud. Through our district advisory committee, we recently revised our three district priorities to provide more clarity and focus. And so these priorities are that we use data to improve adult practice and student outcomes. We focus on students furthest from opportunity to close the gaps and we create high performing systems and teams. Looking at data is really not a judge on instructional on individual practice, but it's about how we adjust our practice to ensure that we're meeting our students needs and data informs uh, where we have to provide professional development, which includes coaching support. It informs whether we have the right curriculum that meets the needs of our students. Data and our iReady assessments, which is an adaptive tool, help us to pinpoint student performance gaps and address those in an efficient way. Um, moreover, teachers can look for gap trends that allow us to tailor reteaching for, um, for knowledge and skill gaps. And I'm very proud of the efforts um, of many of our school leadership teams as they dive into, as they begin to develop a school data culture. This culture allows us to focus on our students furthest from opportunity with surgical pre precision to allow student gaps to be recognized and addressed early at the site level, the grade level teams, site PLCs, and school leadership teams meet regularly during collaboration time to engage in this process. I wanna give a little update about Cabrillo. Um, the board as well as the school and district administrators continue to receive advocacy letters from students, families, and staff. And I want to reassure you that we hear the concerns and desires and remind you that we're in the process of moving forward with planning both short-term and long-term solutions in collaboration with the Cabrillo community. Principal Dr. Terry Flora has launched a staff committee to determine a short-term st solution starting with the 22-23 school year. The committee held their second meeting today and their final recommendation and associated costs projections will be shared back with cabinet who will begin planning for fall implementation. And I'll update the board and the community about this um, in early spring. Finally, at the request of the board, district staff are exploring possible funding options for the midterm, midterm option that you had requested at the last board meeting. Staff will continue to explore multiple options to address long-term facility needs at Cabrillo Middle School. Uh, 
And on a related topic, the district and the city of Santa Clara continue to collaboratively meet regarding the new lease agreement for the YAC on Cabrillo's campus. The agreement will become effective prior to the beginning of the next school year and significant progress has been made as we anticipate negotiations concluding in the next few months. Uh, the Superintendent's Committee on School Climate and Culture is getting ready to launch in March. We received a strong response uh, to the call for volunteers to serve on the committee. A total of 52 applications were received and each one was carefully reviewed and considered by all members of the review committee. Last week, letters went out to applicants, including those who've been accepted to the committee. As we work to form the committee that is diverse as our district, we are still finalizing a few student and parent representatives. The committee will kick off their first meeting on Tuesday, March the 29th, and meet monthly for the first semester, and then every other month going forward. And I look forward to bringing updates to the board regarding this. As a reminder, the purpose of the committee is to examine data regarding school climate, provide recommendations and actions and key messages, and promote SCUSD's work to assess current culture and climate as it affects learning in order to create and sustain an inclusive, safe, and welcoming school environment for all. This includes developing recommendations and identified issues related to school climate culture, including student dress and LGBTQ student supports. This last week, the expanded cabinet plus met in a strategic planning retreat with a focus on developing collective coherence and understanding of our strategic plan to present the first draft of action plans in a consultancy protocol and to collaborate on alignment with the district's three priorities. And each of the strategic priority teams has been provided the opportunity to work with the consultants to craft and re refine their action plans. And as the team builds their collective muscle in this work, the planning progress will accelerate. Um, some adjustments have been made in the strategic outcomes as the timeline for launching some of the activities. With the support of executive cabinet and the consultants, each strategic outcome lead will have their action plans completed late spring. And next month, we will reconvene to review progress and to provide more training to build capacity of our leaders to develop quality plans. Um, community activities are starting to spool up. So this last, uh, this last Monday, I attended PTA Council with Trusty Gonzalez. Um, we also continued our site visits recently out at Bowers, Huerta, and Montague. And I want to give a big shout out to our school staff for supporting these visits. Um, earlier this month, I launched the second round of my group meetings with principals. Um, and these meetings are part of my strategic leadership to support an open forum for principals to freely share what's challenging, where they need support, and for me to talk about what's on the horizon to tee up the conversations for spring planning. The information that I gather from these sessions is brought back to uh, either specific division heads or brought up to cabinet for further consideration. And I wanna thank trustee Muirhead for helping to organize a meeting with assembly member, Alex Lee. So where we were able to share perspectives from the various school districts, superintendents and board members regarding implementation challenges from directives from the state, including COVID-19 testing and reporting, workforce shortage and funding for TK which is a challenge, an added um, program for community funded districts like us. And as I close out my, converse, my comments this evening, I just wanna thank the Benevity Community Impact Fund for their donation of $2,700 to Santa Clara High School, to use for AP Computer Science course, athletics and the mock trial, and uh, Santa Clara High School Athletic Boosters for their donation of $4,000 to be used for athletics. And I wanna wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day also to our UTSC president who has her anniversary on Valentine's Day um, and want to wish everyone a good weekend. Thank you very much for those updates. Next on the agenda is item F, reports from student board representatives. And I believe we have some videos queued up. Thank you. Hello, it's Crystal Escalera here from New Valley High School, and I'm here to share details with you for this month of February. Hello, it's Crystal Escalera here from New Valley High School, and I'm here to share details with you for this month of February. Our leadership class created a spirit week taking place from the 14th through the 18th. Here on this slide that I created, Monday will be candy grams and wear Valentine colors. Tuesday is dressed as your favorite movie character. Wednesday, wear pink. 
Thursday will be throwback Thursday and our teachers will dress like they would in high school. And last but not least, Friday is pajama day. Along with that, leadership is making good progress on the yearbook and I will give further details of that, about that in the next video. Our students get the chance to interact with one another every Friday going into clubs. For example, some choices they have are ping pong, video games, a women's group, a men's group, and many other choices. To conclude this video, COVID testing is always available here on campus every Wednesday and is never too late to sign up. All you need is a permission slip sign. And thank you for listening to this video. Hey everyone, my name is Pollock and I'm a senior at Wilcox High School and I'll be giving a report for Wilcox this week. Um, first thing is that winter ball um, is still being postponed. As of now, it's scheduled for the end of February, but we haven't really heard back. Um, and we wanna make sure that we hold an event that is safe as per um, public health guidelines. Um, so in the meantime, all class councils and classes are working towards Fantastics, which is sort of our battle of the classes. Um, and so class councils are holding practices for dances and games in the upcoming weeks. Um, Wilcox is also holding a school day SAT in the first week of March um, for juniors that want to opt in for that. Um, and then another important thing to note is that our WASC um, accreditation is coming up in the beginning of March. So uh, staff members, community members, and students are preparing and getting ready for that. And finally, um, this Tuesday, we had our winter sports rally. So winter sports are wrapping up as some of our teams move on to league and things like that. So we just wanted to highlight some of our athletes. Um, that's it for my report this week. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and please continue to stay safe. Thank you. Already, I always love hearing from our students. Okay, next is item G. Uh, G.1 is the report from union presidents and I see them in the room. So uh, who's gonna race up to the mic first? <laughs> okay, don't take all night ladies. <laughs> So bear with me. And it's on, right? Yep. Okay. Good evening. First, I want to thank all of you, all of you, Dr. Gonzalez, Mr. Scheel, and Dr. Kemp, for doing the right and the truly most ethical and decent thing in ensuring that a longtime devoted district employee got the health benefits she needs. And you know what I'm talking about. I don't want to betray her confidentiality, but she needs it such a critical time. I really do thank you from the bottom of my heart. And she does too. I spoke with her before I talked here and she, she was crying. So thank you. Um, on another topic, Santa Clara Unified School District has superheroes in our midst. Um, two CSA employees, uh, Tony Acevedo, and Pedro Ricardo saved the day at Hughes Elementary. They were the first to notice smoke coming from a house across the street from the school. And Tony immediately called 911 and ran across the street and began banging on the windows and the doors of the house to, to get, the, because there's a car in the driveway to get the people out and to alert them. Um, and at the same time, um, excuse me, <laughs> Pedro alerted the school. We were able to keep the students safe we were able to ensure that the neighborhood um, received minimal damage because we contacted the fire department immediately. And I don't know if this is good or bad for the homeowners. They happened to be on vacation in Hawaii at the time. So although they were not in the home, that probably isn't the best thing for them to come home to. But thanks to their attention to the, their surroundings and their quick thinking, the students were safe, the neighborhood was safe. And so this is another example that CSA employees all, always look out for one another, the students and the community. I, I was walking around like a proud mother all day yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 350 executive board officers attended, attended officer skills training this month to be prepared to be the best servants to our members as we can possibly be. And we have also scheduled two more planning days for our executive board to continue working on our goals and our plans. Uh, we're gonna have one on February 26th and then we're planning the next one for the next time Ann Cummins Bogan is in the, uh, the district to help us facilitate that. CSEA and special ed 
working together are sending nine paras, paraeducators to the upcoming virtual CSEA para conference. Um, there they will learn strategies, they will acquire skills, they will connect with colleagues from across the state, and they will get access to a variety of resources to help them become more proficient at their jobs and to better serve the students that we all care about. February, once again, I remind you, this is CSEA Have a Heart Month. Um, we collect donations toward the Dorothy Bjork Humanitarian Fund, which provides financial support to classified employees undergoing difficult circumstances, whether through its natural disasters, local situations, or even personal situations where they need financial help. So although we do not have jars this year, I will be sharing with you the online donation so that you can, everybody here, and make an online donation to the Dorothy Bjork Humanitarian Fund. Edson Sanchez Rojas, our chapter communications officer and district transition specialist presented a, um, provided a presentation on interview skills at our most recent chapter meeting where he um, provided a lot of information to help our members as they strive to grow professionally. And this um, was exceptionally well done. And I think it's an asset to the district that they have him helping our students who are transitioning into the real world, as well as helping our classified employees as they try to grow in their own personal uh, lives. And finally, I wanna share that Ann Cummins Bogan met with the transportation, she's here this week, you can see she's sitting here. <laughs> she met one of, among many things that she did this week, one of them that was a highlight for me was that she met with the transportation department uh, to help establish communication structures and collaborative processes with the goal of creating a strong and cohesive and effective team to better serve our staff and students with their techno, techno, technology needs, technological, I knew I'd say it, technological needs. So with all that having been said, happy anniversary, Amber, and happy <laughs> Valentine's Day. And, and I just wanna say one thing, I am really against the designated hitter. Have a good evening. <laughs>
for our members going above and beyond and not being fully compensated for time beyond contract. And then the final hard conversation around class size and maximizing adult to student interactions as we continue to navigate the impact of this pandemic. And with that, I'll close. Thanks. I'm sorry, that adorable picture with the umbrellas was Joni Nellis at Hughes. Just wanted to be clear on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Margie. Okay. Next item is G.2, our COVID-19 update. All right. So um, since the last board meeting, January the 27th, I'd like, I'd like to have the, the team to come over if you don't have a mic, if you're speaking on this, uh, go ahead and come over here to the podium. Uh, over the last couple of board meetings, I've, I've shared with the board my advocacy work to shift the burden put on us by the public health protocols uh, away from schools and back to public health departments as we continue to shift um, into the endemic phase of COVID-19. At the last meeting, I shared with the board the um, letter, the advocacy letter that led to others, including one from the County Superintendents Association and the School Boards Association. Uh, additionally, there have been uh, further advocacy uh, to the state um, regarding this matter. As an update, I want to acknowledge that the Santa Clara County Public Health Department has, been made, has made some recent changes to begin to shift the work of investigating and tracing case clusters to their health teams. Um, school and district administration will continue to identify cases and exposure. So this has been a nice transition of, of this back to uh, over to public health. You um, will likely hear more about our revised tracing and notification methods. Um, and what I wanna share now is that we have seen successful return on investment of the shift to the group-based tracing and notifications. This is the most efficient way to get this information out quickly for staff and families while reducing the resource draw of administrators uh, away from our daily mission of educating students. So I want to uh, now hand it over to Mr. Rico, who's gonna give you updates uh, from the federals all the way down to um, what's happening in the district. Thank you. So as Dr. Kemp shared, I am uh, back again to share with you ahead of our district updates, what we're, what's coming down from federal, state and local jurisdictions. Um, as has been happening since December, things change rapidly and by the day. Um, most recently from the federal, the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee is meeting tomorrow on Friday, February 11th, and they'll review the Pfizer vaccine data for children under five. Um, it's still looking like vaccines for children under five could be available by the end of February. Uh, from the state, the state will be lifting its universal indoor masking requirement on February 16th. However, the state health orders will continue to require universal indoor masking in many settings after February 16th, and this includes all K-12 schools, childcare facilities, public transit, healthcare facilities, shelters, jails, and long-term facilities. This Wednesday, Governor Gavin Newsom announced that his administration will be releasing an endemic plan. So as we share, we're moving from pandemic to endemic. Uh, and he says to quote, hopefully in a matter of days, maybe as soon as Monday. So that kind of jives with our changing by the day. Um, part of his plan, he says, will outline steps for possibly lifting indoor mask mandates for schools too. So we'll be definitely be paying a lot of attention to what comes out from that. From our county health department on February 9th, the public health department announced that it will not lift local indoor masking requirements when the state lifts theirs on February 16th. Instead, our local county health department will continue to base their decisions on whether and when to lift the indoor masking requirements on the risk posed by COVID-19 using clearly defined metrics related to vaccinations, hospitalizations, and COVID-19 case rates. The county says that it does anticipate that they will be able to lift the indoor masking requirements for the general community in a matter of weeks. As case rates continue to decline. Uh, regarding the rates, the county's overall vaccination rate is over the county's required metric uh, of 80%. The vaccination rates of children in Santa Clara County, I'm also happy to report, do continue to increase. Uh, last that we reported to the board and community, 
uh, children 5 to 11 were vaccinated at a 48.5% rate. As of yesterday, it was 52.5. So that is continuing to increase here in the county. And overall, um, our county vaccination rate is 84.1% for all uh, folks who are eligible. So that's residents five years old and up. As the COVID-19 surge continues its decline, the positive case rates in the county do continue to drop rapidly. The current seven day average for daily case rates is 1,760. And that's compared to the prior week's average of 2,883 average. So it's declined about almost half over one week. The county would like to see the seven day average at or below 550 for at least a week before lifting any further restrictions. So we do have at least a couple of more weeks to go. As for the hospitalization rates, the county says they don't have a specific a metric that they want to see, uh, but they do say to quote, to, um, quote uh, they want to see that the rates are low and stable in the judgment of the health officers so will also be monitoring that. From our county, uh, our own county education office with the case rates declining in the county, the county office of education's temporary general exposure notice expires tomorrow, February 11th. Um, I'll share just a moment about our our notification and tracing process here in Santa Clara Unified and how that impacts us. As for Santa Clara Unified updates overall with the federal, state and local mandates and guidance in a phase of transition right now, we're continuing to monitor these updates from news on a daily basis and we lean on our KUDOS COVID-19 action team to continue to address the shifts that are needed in Santa Clara Unified as we go along. We'll continue to keep the board and community informed as we move forward. Regarding our tracing and notification methods, as we shared last month on January 12th, the California Department of Public Health revised their guidance for schools to provide us with a group-based tracing and notification method as an alternative to the individual close contact tracing and notifications that had been previously required. Rather than the temporary method allowed, allowed by the County Office of Education, SUSD has been using the CDPH group tracing and notification method since January 18th. And with overwhelmingly positive feedback from our families, staff, and administrators, we plan to continue to use this method going forward. As Dr. Kemp shared, it is efficient for staff to implement, and it does allow us for very timely communications and access to information for our families and our staff. It's also a method that our system can reasonably keep up with should we face another surge in the future. The individual notices will continue to be sent to our positive cases, household close contacts, unmasked close contacts, and staff close contacts. And uh, with that next, uh, I will turn it over to my colleagues here to share additional SUSD information. Dr. Gonzalez. Good evening. I have two, uh, two updates. We continue to work on increasing the, uh, the staffing to support our COVID uh, cases. So we are now collaborating with Mission College to have our the vocational nurse interns uh, support our district during positive pools. You actually have the MOU uh, later on. And in regards to substitutes, uh, I wanted to give you a small report. During the month of December, we hired 17 new substitutes, um, 11 in January, and we're in the process of hiring 12 more. So we continue to, um, to review those applications and, and to enroll more people. Thank you. I'm very pleased to report that we continue to see a positive trend in attendance. This week, we are averaging approximately 95% attendance, which is considerably higher than the 87% last week. And to maintain this positive trend, we are continuing outreach to families whose students are not in school, utilizing our attendance liaison to cut conduct home visits and developing district-wide messaging. So we hope that this trend continues. And with regard to independent study program, we're continuing to see a slow drop in enrollment. Elementary is currently at 110 students. We have 40 students in grades six through eight and 47 high school students. We um, are waiting for guidance from the state regarding the independent study for next year. And so that will be likely coming uh, down the line later this spring. I also want to express uh, gratitude to the volunteers in our community who have stepped up during the challenging times. 
Uh, the uncertainty of the recent surge of COVID has brought resulting staffing shortages, as you know, and has been a challenge for our community has taken a commitment and enthusiasm of service to be here for us. Uh, after reaching out to the community, it only took day, two days to receive over 200 responses of community members ready to play the role of a volunteer in this initiative. And the eagerness of our community has really been remarkable. Um, if you didn't see the follow-up email uh, last week for people who filled out the original form and expressed interest, um, we wanna just let our community know to check their spam folder uh, because the instructions were sent to you and there's still time to help before the February break. Over the last three weeks, we had 77 uh, volunteers who are placed at school sites and 218 hours have been received across 19 schools throughout the district. We have an estimated 332 volunteer hours that will be received by February the 18th when the project uh, is planned to conclude for, uh, for this period until uh, after the break. Although the purpose of the Santa Clara Together initiative is to address problems that were due to the COVID surge, as it ends, we hope to continue developing our volunteer core to address future needs and to help support equitable access to volunteers for schools who have traditionally struggled with parent volunteer support even before the pandemic. So in closing, um, as the COVID mandate landscape is quickly changing at the federal, state, and local levels, we will need direction from the board on whether to continue with the SUSD outdoor mask mandate put in place by the board last, last year. Key factors that I'd like the board to uh, consider as shared by doctors and healthcare officials are vaccines are available for school-age children. We're coming up to 12 weeks since they were approved for our five to 11 year olds. The vaccine will soon be available for children four and under. Uh, CDPH has continued to maintain that outdoor masking is not recommended mitigation strategy for schools and the state has indicated that they will soon be revisiting indoor masking guidance for schools. And last week we shared about a petition from UC, uh, USCF COVID doctors I think it's UCSF COVID doctors uh, and researchers who are pushing for school guidance, including masking requirements to be revisited as the Omicron surge uh, subsides. So with that, that is our COVID report. And I'd like to um, ask our board president to um, lead the board in a discussion regarding whether or not you would like for us to go and revisit the outdoor masking requirement. We talked about placing it on the agenda for next time. For next time. Okay, so we'll bring it back on the 24th of February? Yes. On the board agenda? Yes. Okay. Would you like to put that under discussion? Discussion slash action? Yes. Okay. Because I want it clear to the public that we'll be discussing it. And possibly taking action? Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right, so we'll list that under district COVID safety plan, masking, outdoor masking requirements. Because it's in our safety plan. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I just hesitated there because if the state is coming out with indoor masking changes, do we just want to say masking update or rather than outdoor masking? I think that uh, I don't know what the time we may is. not we may not have a, and I don't believe we will have indoor masking changes. Okay. During this school year. Okay, then we'll just uh, yeah reference outdoor masking. So did staff get that written down, please? Thank you, President Muirhead. I don't know that we have any metrics for this, but the what this board passed was that outdoor masking was required only when students were within six feet of each other. When they were past six feet, they didn't. So that sounds good until you implement it. Um, and then the question is, were they actually required to wear masks very often? Or were they always six feet apart? Or were they always so close together? They always had masks on. I'd love to get some feedback from the schools themselves. It's gonna be anecdotal because I don't think we have any other mechanism, but I'd like to get that feedback so that when we're looking at this, we have some idea of what the experience at our sites has been. Thank you. Okay, we can have, we can uh, do a straw poll at our schools. We're supervising the outdoor masking situation. Great. Okay, uh, any other comments or questions about the COVID update? Madam President. Uh -huh. if, we can, if we can list it as action, whether nothing occurs and it's a status quo issue, I just think that um, the public should be aware that we, we can and probably may take action on it. And yeah, we said we'd, we'd mark it as action. I think we said discussion slash action. But yeah, but I think it's just action. Just action. Do you think it's clearer? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. That's fine. 
Is that uh, you got that? Okay. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Yes, Trustee Fairchild. Thanks, President Muirhead. I just have a, a clarification. Um, I submitted a question um, and I for the superintendent, and I got a response. And then I went back and I actually watched the board meeting because it didn't match what I remembered. So if you go back to last board meeting at four hours and 29 minutes, <laughs> uh, we discussed uh, bringing back that the great, both grapefruit contracts would come back to this agenda and that we would um, also review what was discussed on onboarding. Um, we as a board got one contract, we asked to then have both of them. And so I was surprised that they weren't attached to the agenda um, and so since then, thank you, Dr. Camp has sent me both contracts, but I feel uncomfortable with the, as the only board member who has both contracts, especially because they were supposed to come back for a further discussion. Well, this item was referred to legal counsel and legal counsel uh, provided a memo to the board. Um, regarding the contracts and over uh, the review. Uh, Mr. Scheel um, was going to talk about the onboarding. We uh, didn't catch that in the agenda setting. And I mean, we can talk a little bit about this, but this is not currently agendized uh, in the meeting. So I, my suggestion is if, uh, if I work with the board president to find out specifically, if you could send us exactly what the questions are for the onboarding, we could uh, talk about this, but I really am hesitant to speak about it this evening um, because the board did receive a legal memo regarding this matter. So, so last uh, board meeting, um, we discussed this under the COVID-19 update, all of the, what I'm asking right now. It was not a separate agenda item. So I don't see how, what the difference is. I guess my, my question is, if you would like to go back and look at what was said at the board meeting, it's very uncomfortable as a board member to leave the board meeting, have it very clear what you think is going to happen, coming back to a board meeting, see it's not there, send the questions, say it's not going to happen. So um, I would just, obviously not everyone has the contracts. I'm the only one who's gotten both contracts. It would just be very helpful in the future. I, I'm pretty detail oriented. So when I send a question, it's not coming out of nowhere. So the board does have access to both contracts. It was linked in the January 21st uh, weekend update under the COVID section. There's a document linked inside that document, which is what I sent to you this afternoon, uh, Trustee Fairchild. And so I can resend this to the board in the weekend update so they can see these contracts that were reviewed by legal counsel. Um, at, at this point, I'm, I don't want to put Mr. Shale on the spot, but I'll have him provide a written uh, a description of the onboarding meeting that he had with legal counsel. I mean, not with legal counsel, with, with Grapefruit before they came on board. So it was, I guess it was unclear to the board that it was linked in a document that was linked in a document that was linked in a document. Thanks. Okay, so then is... Mm -hmm. um, is the part about onboarding going to come back then at the next meeting, or are you going to send us something? We'll put it in my weekend update that goes to the board. This uh, goes this goes this weekend. Okay. President. Um, yes, Trustee Redman. Yeah. So I did just take a look. Um, I remembered that there was a response in the superintendent's response to questions under item G1, which was the one we're on, which is the COVID-19 update. And there was a request to have the contracts there. The response that we got back was that they were provided in a separate communication on 121. That would have been a Friday. Um, and so I'm not sure exactly, I guess that was a, an update that was sent to us. Um, but what I don't understand here, when you look at this, this is public, you can follow along if you want. COVID, um, it, it's, there was a request to put the contracts there. And so why not just do it? They're public records. I know there's some opinion about some conversations related to grapefruit and some of the conditions around grapefruit. I won't get into that, but the contracts themselves are public record. And so if there was a request, 
I think it's something that the rest of the public should have the opportunity to see. And particularly when you have a board member who's requested you put it on there, I don't understand why you would say no to doing that. It, it just seems odd to me. Um, and so I, I don't want to belabor the point now. What I do want to do is suggest, let's get those out there. Let's have them posted to the agenda. Let's make sure anybody who wants to see what the contracts are can read them because again, they're public records. Um, and then we will uh, talk about it more next time. I do think it's actually agendized where you could talk about it today, but let's make it crystal clear so that we don't have anybody saying that we are taking things out of, out of turn. Thank you. So should we, uh, it sounds like they were asked to have them attached to this agenda, uh, this COVID item for this agenda. So can we get those contracts? Well, well now I'd want to attach to the next one. The next agenda. It's this one, everybody's going to take it and put it aside. So we're going to talk about it. The next agenda is what I think I heard saying. If you need, I can make a motion. To, maybe that's what I should do. I'll make a motion. We bring this item back to, to have the... Um, Contracts for grapefruit on there, as well as a discussion of what can be spoken about in public uh, at the next meeting uh, as an agenda item. And then if that gets carried by the board, that will be something that we will have to do. That, okay, thanks. So uh, I, I just got down that the motion is to bring the contracts back at the next meeting and have a discussion. Was that yes. adequate? Okay. And with the onboarding. Um, and, and you want the onboarding information as part of that discussion also. This will all be part sure. of the COVID. Yeah. I mean, what I'm looking for is transparency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we may get some stuff, but I want to make sure anybody who wants to find out what's going on can do it. I don't want there to be stuff that's hidden. As far as I'm concerned, all this stuff is public record. Public, we should have the opportunity to see it. It should be readily available to them. So I want as comprehensive as you can make this report. Thank you. It's specifically related to the relationship contracts the whole thing with grapefruit. Okay. And uh, so we have that motion from Trustee Ratterman, seconded by Trustee Gonzalez. Is there any more uh, questions or comment on the this motion? Uh, Trustee Gonzalez? Well, I second it. I think it's important for the public to be uh, aware and, and to be transparent for the board that the, they understand that the contracts and what grapefruit is doing on our site. Obviously, we're we have uh, no involvement in uh, in their method or procedures in many cases, but you know we're, we're trying to facilitate you know the, the community, the staff, and, and really staff and students now um, with uh, with that process. But uh, I think it's good for the public to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Um, did you have another comment, Trustee mm. Fairchild? No. Oh, okay. So um, I just want to confirm, is um, Trustee Ryan off the webinar? Okay, then we don't need to do the roll call. Okay, um, so then we have this motion to bring the contracts um, back at the next meeting and the onboarding information uh, as part of our COVID update at the next meeting. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that's... Um, and Jim is not here. So that passes uh, five to zero with Trustee Ryan and Trustee Canova um, absent. Okay, uh, other comments or questions about COVID report? Uh, Trustee Fairchild. Um, I would just like to thank all the staff that have worked so hard to survive January. <laughs> um, I don't think anyone wants to relive January ever again. Um, and I would like to ask our public who may be traveling during February break to places that are not like the Bay Area and do not mask and do not, are, may not or not be vaccinated to please, please try not to get anything that you bring back to us. Um, because I don't want to have a March like our January. So although hopefully it's already worked through the system, but I just, um, as a mother of kids who are at a middle school and an elementary school, and I could see the fatigue um, in the teachers and 
the custodians and the paras and everyone and the uh, administrators and the secretaries and everyone and the nurses and the nurses assistants. I just wanted to give you a heartfelt thanks. And I hope that what that is done and we can move forward and um, get more rest. Thank you. Um, and on that note, I'm um, kind of encouraged that there's uh, a number of opportunities to get free testing in addition to in our schools and at Grapefruit, you can also order tests from the federal government and you can order, you can pick up tests from the county and uh, health insurers are now required to reimburse tests, uh, the rapid tests in all these cases. So um, if you're traveling, please test. Okay, uh, then we will. I do want to make one statement before we go because we have February break coming up. Yes. We have procured uh, a test for every staff member in our district. These, these will be distributed before the February break so that they will be able to take a test before they return to work. And so we encourage everyone who is uh, all of our employees who will be traveling or um, out of the office to utilize these tests before they return to work. And we paid for them and bought them before the state decided to issue them to us. And now we're gonna get another set of tests. So uh, from our governor. Okay, well, that's good to hear. Um, that'll help us feel a little safer. Okay then uh, we can move on to the next item. Yeah, so uh, this is H.1 is public comment on unagendized items. And um, I do see, uh, I do have some slips for people in the room. And if you are not in the room, if you are on the live stream, please join the webinar. If you're on the webinar and you would like to speak, please, uh, raise your hand at this point. And I am uh, uh, trying to find my information about what I'm supposed to read out. Um, we'll take the, the comments in the room first. And uh, I wanna remind the public that we do have board policy 1310.1 on civility, which states, this policy promotes mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among district employees, parents, and the public. This policy is not intended to deprive any person of his or her right to freedom of expression, but only to maintain to the extent possible and reasonable a safe, harassment-free workplace for our students and staff. In the interest of presenting district employees as positive role models to the children of this district, as well as the community, Santa Clara Unified encourages positive communication and discourages volatile, hostile, or aggressive actions. This district seeks the public's cooperation with this endeavor. Okay, so for um, public comment in the room, we first have Ann Cummins-Bogan, and then we'll have Kristen Gonzalez. And Ann, it is so nice to see you in person. It's been so long. Can you see my big smile under my mask? <laughs> Um, I'm really excited to have this opportunity and I'm going to watch the clock because some of you know being succinct isn't always my gift, but um, it dawned on me uh, after a meeting this morning with Dr. Kemp and Amber and Lynn, uh, just a really kind of energizing dialogue about lots of things going on in the district, um, both celebratory about things like student growth that are starting to be recognized with the iReady benchmark assessments but also you know, various challenges that they really truly roll up their sleeves and, and start to talk about together. And I realized with COVID, we have fewer opportunities to come together at conferences in San Diego and highlight the good work in, San, in Santa Clara. And so I just thought I would share some of the impressions I've had in the last three days that I've been in the district. I've had the opportunity to see the district priorities in action. I see uh, teachers working collaboratively um, in PLC time, time that has been negotiated and, and developed in collaborative partnership with building administrators to ensure that there's time to dive deeply into data. I listen to the nuanced reflections of teachers um, and the deep connections they have with their students, helping to both celebrate the strategies that are working and figure out the strategies that aren't. I see um, conversations taking place it, throughout the various departments, I had an opportunity to watch exchanges with the special edu education department and union leadership, ed services and union leadership, 
Um, Brad Stam's department, um, CAIO, I forget all the acronyms, I apologize. I've met with TOSA's school psychologists, instructional coaches, paraprofessionals, and principals. And I just think that at the end of the day, we have to remember what kudos is about is impacting students. What student, what kudos is about is improving instruction. I will also say we've begun courageous conversations in business services. We had a great uh, session, I think, uh, with the technology department. And I just wanted to take this moment to make sure people are aware of all the good things happening with labor management partnerships in this district. So thank you. Thank you very much for coming, coming out tonight and sharing that with us. Ms. Gonzalez. Good evening. Uh, good evening, trustees, Dr. Kemp, district staff and community. It's good to see you all in person. It's been a while. I haven't been in this room since it's flipped. <laughs> um, I'm Kristen Gonzalez, principal at Wilcox High School. And before I start, I want to note that it was not planned. <laughs> Anne was here to address partnerships, but what I'm here to address is actually under the umbrella of partnerships with the board. Um, and specifically what I'm here to address is the process that the board uses for addressing complaints and concerns that come from our community. Trustees, I appreciate that uh, prior to the pandemic, I would see you out and about at community gatherings and things, and we would say hello or at school events, and you would always say, let me know if you need anything or do you need anything? And I would say, oh yeah, I'll let you know. I don't really, you know, I, but I'm here tonight because I do need something. <clears throat> and what I need is for you, the board, to please follow the process of redirecting complaints and concerns from our staff, from our students and our parents back to the school sites. When you receive these, please redirect them. And I'm here tonight solely speaking for myself. Um, I've not have a, had a conversation with this, uh, with my colleagues about this. In fact, no one knew I was coming, not even Dr. Kemp, not even Ann. <laughs> um, but I can assure you there are other administrators at the district and site levels that feel the same way. And I'd just like to highlight when you don't follow the process of redirecting issues back to the site, it really does cause a lot of additional work and strain on our system and our people on a system of people who are already working very hard during COVID times, and it erodes trust and relationships in a community that is built on relationships. So please, I implore you to follow the process. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. And I think maybe Dr. Kemp and I need to have um, a little uh, discussion at one of our next one-on-ones where we talk about, make sure we understand what the the process is and what the concern is. We do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, that was public comment in the room. Now we are going to public comment on unagendized items out in the um, Zoom. So to remind you, if you are on the Zoom and you wanna talk about something that is not on the agenda, now is the time to raise your hand. So I will turn it over to Ms. Rico to manage the public comment. Did you have a statement that you wanted? There is, but okay. I think I paraphrased it. Okay. I don't have it in front of me. Okay. Oh, our, uh, there's an echo in the room, sorry. Okay. Um, so we have several public comments to for each member of the public who wants to speak. We will have a timer available for you on screen. Each member of the public is allotted two minutes. At the end of two minutes, we will need to uh, move on to the next speaker in order to ensure equitable speak time. Uh, when I call on your name, you should be prompted to unmute your microphone. Hey, Ms. Rico, before you start that, I do have the paragraph that I probably should read before... before uh... You go into that? Okay. okay. Is now is now good? Okay. You're the chair. Um, so it's the paragraph of just about unagendized comments. So um, the public should note that while we value and want to receive public feedback, 
Board members are prohibited by state law from commenting on, discussing, or taking action on items that are not on the meeting's agenda. The, the board may refer the commenter to a staff member or other resources for factual information, ask staff to report back to the board at a subsequent meeting concerning any matter, or take action directing staff to place a matter of business on a future agenda. So please recognize that we appreciate your comments and we are listening. We can't always have a discussion. We can't have a discussion about them during the meeting. Thank you. Okay, back to you. Okay, our, our first member to speak is Kathy Thornton. You should be prompted to unmute your microphone. Good evening, Dr. Kemp, uh, President Muirhead and the Board of Trustees. My name is Kathy Thornton and I'm a teacher in the district. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Santa Clara Unified is my community. My parents trusted this district with my education, just as I trusted this district to educate my now grown children. I love this community. And of course, I love my students. I'm deeply troubled about the lack of concern for the safety of our children. We're tasked to teach many children with high need whose needs are not being met, which causes behavioral issues and emotional stress to other students. Both children and teachers fear for their safety. When there is an incident in a class, the approach is all hands on deck, administration, security, paraeducators, teachers, custodians, office staff, other staff, I can go on, which then leaves the remainder of the campus vulnerable. Heaven forbid we have another incident occur at the same time. Our campuses are not prepared to deal with the significant resources needed to keep all students safe. There are many changes um, that need to happen. We do talk about social emotional learning all the time. Uh, students can't learn if they don't feel safe. My particular ask is to consider adding more security to the comprehensive high school campuses. Thank you for your time. Public to speak is Amy Magana. Amy, it looks like you have an older version of Zoom. So you can go to our public comments webpage to download the most recent uh, version of Zoom. You can also uh, call in, um, see if I can find the phone number here at 669-900-9128 and use the raise hand feature uh, on screen for that. Our next member of the public to speak is April Lujan. Hi. Lost her. Sorry about the April Tragen. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry. My name is April Lujan. I am a teacher at Wilcox High School, Physical Education and Health. I've been teaching in the district since fall of 2009, and I went. I started here at Laurelwood, so I am very close to this district. Uh, I am speaking on behalf of security issues. I have never felt threatened from a student or a staff member ever since being a student or a staff member at Wilcox until this Monday, and. It was a therapeutic student. I am all about inclusion and welcoming all my students into class. However, a student became aggressive when I asked them to put their cell phone away. Uh, as Kathy Thornton said, I couldn't get a hold of security. Admin was busy. Um, his case, their case manager was busy. And I'm asking that you really look into funding for more security on the high school campuses. I'm not sure what middle school and elementary school go through. But my students were very nervous. I was very nervous. And I know that my fellow colleagues have also been threatened this past year by their own students. And it was very difficult to get someone to help them. And being a single teacher in a classroom, uh, in the classroom, it's 35, but for physical education, it's 45. And so I'm speaking on behalf of not only my students, myself, but my colleagues at Wilcox and at Santa Clara, Kathleen McDonald, and New Valley, that you really, truly please look into hiring new, uh, additional security, increasing wages, which makes it more um, welcoming because the pay is very low. I understand that, and people do it out of the kindness of their heart. So, um, yes, that's all I have to say. So, thank you. Thank you. The next member of the public to speak is Anka Dosadal. 
Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. Good evening. Um, although the COVID numbers are improving, COVID is still burning in our community. Therefore, I feel the need to voice my objection to the idea of having children removing their max masks during recess. I would like to remind everyone that when outdoors, the virus does not just disappear like magic. We have had a good number of days with no wind. So viral particles don't dissipate and having helped watch children at recess, I know that there is no way to keep themselves safely separated while they play. Add the fact that the Omicron variant is so very contagious and that the Omicron BA2 variant is being compared to the measles in terms of infectiousness, it seems foolish to abandon the most effective mitigation technique. We wouldn't be okay with someone exhaling cigarette smoke within a couple of feet of our children, even if it was outdoors. But that is what we should think about when a COVID positive child without a mask is exhaling a couple of feet from our children. To be clear, I'm not advocating for kids to wear masks for forever. And I understand that we need to think about a time when the kids can remove their masks. Therefore, I recommend setting, setting metrics so we can allow schools to move to allow the removal of masks when certain milestones are met. For example, perhaps 90% school vaccination rate or less than 100 positive new cases a day um, as a seven day average and less than 1% test positivity in a county as we had in October before the Omicron wave. Let's reward the community for achieving milestones instead of simply declaring a danger over because, with because we are tired of thinking about it. Anyways, thank you for, very much for your time. Thank you and our next commenter is Ian Jackson. Sorry, Ian, you also need to download a newer version of Zoom. Um, you can call in at 669-900-9128. And there will be prompts to use the raise hand feature. You can also email the board your comments at public-comment at susd.net. Our next speaker is Rachel Clark. And the same issue again. Raquel Clark. Sorry, Raquel, you'll need to call in as well. Cecile Cummings. Could we put up the screen again so people can see it? Yeah, I think people don't have the meeting ID number. Amy said she needed the meeting ID number. So on screen, there's the phone number 669-900-9128. And you can use the raise hand feature. You should be prompted, but it's a star nine to raise your hand, star six to unmute. Again, you should have prompts. And the email address is public-comment at susd.net. Ms. Rico, didn't we also find that if you used a district Chromebook, you might have better success if you have a child in the district? Not sure about that, but you could okay. you could use Zoom app on a phone or on the phone as well. Sure. Um, or if you go to our, our board public comment webpage, santaclarausd.org forward slash public comment, there's a, a link to download the latest Zoom. Cecile, you should be prompted to unmute. I see your microphone is unmuted. Yeah. Okay. I just go. was waiting till you finish. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm a life skills teacher at Wilcox, and I just wanted to talk about placement and safety in our classrooms. We already addressed this at a previous board meeting. Um, and I want to start by saying that being injured or destroyed on your job is not part of the special ed staff's job, preaching to the choir with the board, but a lot of people do just simply believe that you take that on when you take a job in special ed. Our job is to teach life skills. Um, and next, there's absolutely no teaching or learning going on when students with violent and aggressive behaviors are misplaced in our classrooms. The teacher's sole job becomes um, keeping the class, this particular student in the class from escalating rather than teaching. These students who escalate are the ones who suffer the most in our classrooms, mostly because of constant sensory stimulation they receive in the public school environment. 
It used to be that students were offered an appropriate non-public school NPS placement immediately if they endangered themselves uh, or others on campus. And I know this because I experienced it in my fourth year at Wilcox when my student who'd been acting out aggressively daily reached into the window of a moving car to grab someone's arm. The principal district immediately called an IEP to determine appropriate placement and the student improved dramatically in the next year in their small sheltered NPS placement. The district is required to pay tuition for these NPS placements until the student reaches the age of 22 years old. So you can see the issue. Um, but meanwhile, aside from these students who become aggressive, not receiving their fair and or free and appropriate public education, the rest of the students in these classrooms are being traumatized, living daily in what's essentially a domestic violence situation. They watch helplessly and in horror as their teachers are beaten, bitten, scratched, or all of the above. No protection is offered to teachers and staff to prevent this. Offering football tackle pads or protective gloves, both of which have been done by so staff on campus helping each other. Time. We do need to move on to the next speaker, uh, but you can email your entire comment at public-comment public at susd.net to the board. Uh, our next speaker is Gwen Schneider. And it's also showing that you need to come with an or come in with a newer version of Zoom. We'll ask our um, IT staff to put the slides back on screen again to share the phone number to call in. I do see some folks have successfully called in with phone numbers and raised their hand. And when you use the phone number on screen, you press star nine to raise your hand. Our next speaker is Teacher K. You should be prompted on mute. Hello. Um, I am calling to share my concerns regarding the class size for the moderate severe program at the Santa Clara School District. Um, as you are aware, this school year has been even more stressful due to trying to reteach students um, the skills that they learn uh, they lost during the distance learning um, and teaching students who are recovering from COVID-19. Um, and while teaching is important, it is not our biggest obstacle. It is the class sizes that have been truly hurting the students and the educators since the beginning. We are expected to teach up to 12 students when the California's Teacher Association recommends up to eight. When the district puts 11 students into our Mastavir program, it does not mean 11 students. Individual students with severe behavioral needs need support from two to three adults. Now, when that support is taken away from that student. The rest of the students who should be learning are not getting that. Because of the district's choice to keep the caseload so high, we are not able to provide the education that our students deserve. And we must do our best to lessen the caseloads for our special education programs so that we can provide meaningful education that they deserve and that they should get from a district that is so supportive of student learning Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comment. Our next speaker uh, should be Laura Stott, but I'm also getting the same uh, error message for you. So if you could call into the phone number or email your comment at public-comment at susd.net. I know the board wants to hear your comment. And our next speaker is Ian Jackson. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name's Ian Jackson. I'm a teacher in the district. I'm also a cluster director for UTSC. Uh, I'm gonna read a letter that was sent to uh, me by some Mod Severe teachers. So good evening, everyone. As a group of Mod Severe teachers, we'd like to recognize that while the special ed department is currently understaffed, they are doing what they can to support us. The recent phase in of safety care training is merely a band-aid to cover the concerns that have been voiced to a revolving door of directors for over a decade. During the last 113 days of the school year, we have experienced assault and battery against teachers and staff, 
use of force and violence by students, destruction of school property, emergency room visits, open wounds, bruises and scars, emotional trauma, and use of personal time for workers' comp. An absence of clearly communicated policies and procedures has led to students being placed into ill-equipped classrooms across grade spans for ages three through 22, without consideration of classroom dynamics and staffing, intensive individual needs that are required, the educational benefit of the student and those around them, critical staff members being pulled from their primary responsibilities, the availability of site level admin supports and campus safety. This is not a time to shame the special ed department, this is a time to acknowledge that the district has not been proactive in providing the level of support required to meet the needs of all staff and students in the special ed department, such as having site-based program specialists, TOSAs, behavior teams and floating aids, elementary VPs and wellness staff who are trained to work with more severe disabilities. We are asking you to give the special ed department the financial resources and oversight to provide all your students and staff with a safe and successful workplace. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next is a phone number calling in, phone number ending in 2487. You should be prompted to unmute. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Um, thank you guys so much for taking the time and allowing me to speak and allowing me to address um, Dr. Kemp and board of directors and the rest of you. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I want to express um, a con congratulations on your guys' sur surplus. Um, I heard that last week that you guys uh, had a surplus, which is fantastic. But it's disappointing and disheartening you see that you guys are in a surplus at the expense of your staff and your students. It's hurtful to see that. It's not a business. It's very hurtful to see your own family member being injured because of your lack of regards for safety and security. It's very disheartening. I, I don't know, you guys can't possibly understand to see that your own mother can't go to work because she got injured with a concussion with one of your guys' students who injured her. Not the first time either. And now that student finally got adjusted and moved because a, in that person or that student injured another, a few others, which is disheartening. It's disheartening to see that there's lack of support and lack of security. It's just, just disheartening. You guys can't imagine that someone with that much pain that can't open the blinds, that can't function, that cannot literally go about because she was so passionate about her work, about your students, about her students, because of your lack of regard for those students and those teachers like her, who literally, that's her, like, her passion. It's disheartening to see that you guys are in a surplus. Like, yes, we're in a surplus, which is, yeah, that's great. It's not, that's, that's unacceptable. You guys got enough money to provide the support that the students and teachers need. How can you be like, yeah, we're in a surplus when it came at the expense and health of each one of your students and your staff? There's a staff shortage, yes, but you're in a surplus? We do need that's, to interrupt to move on simple. to the next speaker. I'm very sorry about that. Each speaker is given two minutes to speak. There is a, a timer on screen, but if you're calling in by phone, you may not be able to see that. Uh, our next speaker is phone number ending in 5527. Should be prompted to unmute. Number 5527, I can see that you've unmuted your microphone. Can you try speaking? Number 5527. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. can you, oh, yes, here I am. Great, sorry about that. 
Um, good evening, Dr. Kemp, President Muirhead. This is Amy Magania. I am a teacher in the district. Um, thanks for the opportunity. First, I'd like to start by saying that I have thoroughly enjoyed teaching life skills at Wilcox High School for 20 years. Um, the reason for my call is regarding safety. As some of you remember, I spoke at a board meeting in early October regarding safety. It was a concern about my students, safety for my students and also myself. As it turns out, I was injured by the student that I was concerned about. I ended up going out on medical leave for two weeks while still having to write lesson plans for my classroom each day. This was followed up by three months of physical therapy for my neck, three months of occupational therapy for my wrist, and psychiatry for my mental health. I was diagnosed with PTSD and I struggled emotionally long after I returned to school. My injury occurred on October 15th and I was finally released from medical care on January 13th. Thankfully, I am better. I got lucky. While out for two weeks on medical leave, that student injured the substitute teacher and an administrator. It was following those incidents that it was recommended, the student was recommended to a non-public school where that student is today. As we approach transitions from middle school to high school, there are many concerns regarding placement and safety for all. I am committed to being a life skills teacher and doing my best up until I retire, which is coming up in the next few years. But I'm not committed to being fearful and having to protect myself from physical harm each day when I arrive at school. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is phone number ending in 7797. You should be prompted to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So this is Gwen Schneider and I will be reading a letter from a special ed teacher from, sorry, I need to get the letter up because I'm on the phone. Um, so it will be about uh, school safety and the special ed classes in elementary. First, I'd like to thank you for um, having the training, the safety training, um, Although she believes it's not sufficient enough to protect our staff and our students in the classroom, as staff injuries still occur almost daily in her classroom when certain students are present. So her letter starts, I come before you this evening because I'm deeply concerned about the so-called diagnostic placements that district administrators are practicing, which I believe to be the root cause of this problem. This year, a student was placed in my program without assessments and IEPs because my program was considered to be the least restrictive environment. Without any data to support such a claim, this student is unable to participate in the curriculum, nor can the student engage with other students in the program because of the safety reasons. This same student lacks sufficient verbal communication skills that continually leads to manifestations of aggressive physical behaviors for attention. I struggle to understand how this child has been placed in the least restrictive environment. On multiple occasions with the special ed administrators and the assistant superintendent of human resources, I have brought up my concerns each and every time. All have assured me that this student will be placed in a more appropriate placement soon. However, six months later, and after filing 12 injury reports for serious injuries such as biting, scratching, and pinching that have broken skin and drew blood from different staff members, this student is still in the same program and no legal actions have been taken by the administration. Increases in student interact, um, initiative aggression have led not only to physical harm and scars on the bodies of staff, but they have also had a negative impact on our emotional well-being thus impacting our ability to deliver quality classroom instruction. As a result, this unfortunate- to, to the next speaker, it's been two minutes. I'm sorry, I know you can't see the time clock okay. on the screen while you're on your phone, but you can submit the remainder of your comment at public-comment at susd.net um, to send it to the board. 
Our next speaker is phone number ending in 6692. Should be prompted to unmute. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, thanks. Um, I am just going to address the comment that came up a little bit ago about using your student's Chromebook to have more accessibility. I'm actually a teacher in the district and I'm using my Chromebook and um, I did not have accessibility. I had to call in on my phone. So that is a misnomer there. Um, I also wanna say that I am coincidentally calling in tonight and a member of the Wilcox teaching staff and I just have to say I did not know and was not aware of some of the concerns with the um, special ed safety issues. And I just, I wanna support all that called in and shared and express my um, absolute backing of their need for that safety. So now I will address what I'm calling for. My name is Laura Scott. You have heard from me before. I'm sorry for that. I'm one of the athletic directors at Wilcox. I'm actually calling with all positivity tonight. I wanted to take the time to say thank you to the board for listening to the students and uh, anyone else that spoke um, first semester regarding our closed tennis courts. We are so excited that you guys heard the message and um, we are beginning the planning stages of the court project. So I just wanted to say thank you for letting the students' voices be heard. It's so powerful. I also wanted to just um, take the time to express gratitude to, um, on behalf of Wilcox, if I have the liberty to do so, um, from our administrative team, our football team, the coaches and the families, our spirit groups, their coaches and their families, and the athletic department, and anyone else that I have missed, um, that helped to make the state championship football trip to Southern California possible and successful. Unfortunately, we did not come out the victor, and that's uh, a whole other thing, but it was a very quick turnaround for the need for everything to happen. So um, I just want to say thank you, especially to the purchasing department, the transportation department, the business department, the chaperones to the um, Santa Clara Unified School District board members, and also to Mr. Baldwin and Dr. Kemp, who were able to attend the event as well. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you for helping us uh, make the trip to Southern California. Sorry, we, and so sorry to interrupt you, but we do need to move on. We, we hit the two minutes. Um, if you have any remainder of your comment left to make, you can make it at public-comment at susd.net. And... In your head, that was the final comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Laura, for the clarification about the Chromebooks. Didn't know. And um, so, Dr. Kemp, we heard a lot of comments from um, teachers about an issue. Um, do you have any comments, or can you follow, uh, follow up with us? Yes, I'm going to uh, follow up. We have a special ed kudos team that's been working to address uh, some of the issues that were brought up in the comments this evening, and uh, we'll find out more information about the safety issues that are there at Wilcox. I'll check in with the principal. Okay, and please let us know. Um, and I really appreciate all those um, teachers who uh, stepped up and spoke tonight. Really do appreciate hearing. Um, Trustee Ratterman, did you have something you wanted to say? Yes, I did. Um, and some of it's already been addressed by Dr. Kemp's comments, but We've heard from multiple teachers and multiple schools. It wasn't just one school about safety concerns about our students and our staff. And I've said this many, many times, safety concerns are our number one priority. So we can't talk about it much today, but I'm gonna make a request that this be brought back, a full report on what's happening here um, and what's been done to address it at the next board meeting. My hope is that by the time it comes back, all of these things will be addressed. When we start to see things that are safety issues, as far as I'm concerned, that's an all hands on deck, immediate emergency response. Now, maybe that's already happened. I don't want to, you know, I can't tell from this and I can't do the inquiry that it would take to do that. But I know it's nice. We have at least one uh, principal here who's heard the comments. I know that Dr. Kemp just indicated she's aware of it, but I'd like to make a motion to have this come back at the next meeting with a comprehensive report uh, because if there's any truth to the safety issues, we have to address those. Thank you. Second. 
I'd like to just let the board know that tomorrow is the deadline for staff to get the reports in for the next board meeting. So we'll need a little time. We also have February break coming. So the other thing that I wanted to also share is that these issues are related to special ed. We are having a special ed study session with the board in March. And I'd like to bring this item back to the special ed study session so the board can hear uh, what's happening within the department and what we're doing to support our school sites, include that part in the uh, study session. Um, so I, I think I can speak for Andy that we're concerned about the safety issues and putting this off for a month doesn't seem reasonable. And I'd like to have some clarity from the board exactly what information you'd like to have us bring back, but we won't have anything ready for the next board meeting. It's not nice. possible. Um, okay, uh, Trustee Fairchild. Um, we have uh, not only our reports due uh, tomorrow, uh, I mean, the agenda won't be posted again for an, uh, a week after that, but um, we have six days of school. For those of you who don't know, an IEP, most of these issues are individual issues with children that can only be solved by having an IEP meeting. There is, you have to give, to, uh, I, gosh, I haven't worked for a while, it's either 10 or 15 days notice to have an IEP meeting to address any of these issues. It's not gonna be solved before next board meeting, especially considering that we are going on vacation a week from tomorrow. Um, that being said, I do, Believe me, I've been there. I've had PTSD from um, clear back in my internship um, with a violent student. And um, it's real and the, the, the fear is there. However, we need to make sure that when we talk about this, um, one, we, we say, please do your job and spend the money you need to address these issues. But I don't think we can have a productive conversation in two weeks about it. And also some of these are completely confidential. They can't be discussed in open session. And so um, we've heard some things tonight that kind of are bordering on a little too much information in public that made me nervous. And so I, I just wanna advise us all one, I, I expect our, our admin hopefully heard and that we can ha go forward with the plan. Um, but I, I'm with you. I don't want to see anyone get hurt. And I've been that special educator. So uh, I wanted to respond real quickly. So look, my concern is I don't feel a sense of urgency. Okay. And that's what my concern is. You said, oh, we won't be able to get to it for, you know, a couple of weeks. I want something done tomorrow if you want an honest to God truth. And I realize this is something that's been out there for a while. I do not know enough about these circumstances. I haven't investigated. All I did was listen to what's said today. And I have memory of what's happened in the past with other multiple conversations. And things don't seem to be happening. In the meantime, we could, I was on this board when we had, when we had a uh, nurse pass away because she fell and hit her head okay that is a horrendous thing to have happened now that one was not something that was anticipated or preventable but some of this stuff is and i want to make sure our people are safe as well as our fellow students in those classrooms are safe so i realize that maybe i'm being hyperbolic and overreacting and if i am my apologies to everybody in the system involved if there's confidential information fine that comes back in a closed session um, but I want something to say, and like I said, I'm hoping when they come back that they have a band-aid to fix this and then a long-term plan to take care of it. So I'm sorry, I realize I may be a little out of line here, but I feel very, very strongly about it when, when it comes to issues of safety. Thank you. Yeah, and we can't have too much of a discussion other than uh, scheduling. You know, we can ask for something to be scheduled. So, um, Trustee Canova, yeah, and I'm not on that go, line. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into any detail here, but, but I just wanted to say that um, uh, I'm inclined to support the position outlined by um, really both Vicky and Stella, actually, which is interesting. But uh, I, I respect Vicky's history, 
um, your your expertise in this area. I completely respect your concern. I think we're all concerned. We're all absolutely concerned. But um, but on this board, this is really Vicky's expertise, and so I, I have to uh, go with your suggestion. Uh, can I respond to that? I, I am not the only expert on this board in special ed, and I just I want to make that clear. The thing is, the actions that, that can be taken to solve these issues are not dependent on board discussion. They're not dependent on our discussion. And so that's where I don't I don't want them to be preparing a report. I, I want them to be solving the problem. I hear you. So. Um, I think what um, Trustee Radman was asking for was a report to come back with um, information about the issue in general and that we're doing something about it. I want to know what they've done. I don't want to tell them how to do it. I don't want to recommend what to do. I want them to come back and tell me they've fixed this problem. I want it to go away. Okay, so instead of the next meeting, can we give them some time to um, to do what they need to do and get back to us and say that, um, so that would be the March 10th meeting? instead of the February 24th meeting. So what's going to happen for this? So I, I want to be very clear. So you're asking me to investigate or have staff investigate the situations that were brought up tonight um, in the board meeting and to provide the board with an update on the status of the uh, placement of the students for resolution of these issues, I'm unclear. I would like to understand what exactly is what this you're asking for. Clear, I, I was trying to do it in a diplomatic way to put this very clearly. I want to know that the kids have been been uh, uh, addressed and are safe, and the staff is safe. And I want to know what you've done about it. And to be honest, I want you to be on this tomorrow. Okay, start working on this. I don't want this to be one of those things we get around to it. If it's a safety issue, let's take care of it now. And I'm sorry, I realize I'm probably pretty extreme about this, but the consequences when you don't do that stuff right can be very horrific, and I don't want to see that happen. If it's portrayed correctly, maybe this stuff that we heard from at least a dozen teachers and multiple sites is completely mis misportrayed. And if it is, you'll take a look at it. You'll say, okay, I found a way to get you know, you'll address that issue and you come back to us next time and say, okay, look, turns out there's a whole lot of things you didn't know, et cetera. But if there's a chance these kids or staff are at risk, I, this is the only way I can think of to say, move, do something right now. So, and you probably would anyway, so I'm not trying to say you wouldn't do that, but I just want to make sure you're really clear of my expectations. Thank you. And, um, and I think it's, it's, also has to be clear that not everything can be discussed in open session about students. And if some of it needs to be done in closed session or if it's something that you can't really discuss specifics, I don't wanna know about specific students, um, but I wanna know that you've done something, right? We make it clear that we don't want you to tell us dispositions of particular students and, and all that. We just, we wanna make sure that uh, everyone is safe. So, um, yeah, we have a motion, but I, I, I would like to adjust it so that uh, if uh, Trustee Raderman is okay, that it's not the next meeting. That I'm not okay. I want a next meeting. It can be a brief one with a follow-up. That's fine. But if it's nothing else, it's like, by the way, we did look into this. We've taken care of a lot of these issues. For right now, they're resolved. Trust us. We've got it fixed. I'll, I'll have the trust in staff if they do that but then come back later with a, in, in March or wherever it is with a more comprehensive report. In other words, and, and the only thing we can do at this point, because it's not agendized, is just ask for an answer at the next right. meeting. That's what I'm trying to get done. Okay, so we don't need a full report by tomorrow. We just um, need something by the next, we need to put it on the agenda. Trustee Fairchild. You're going crazy. Um, I, I'm going a little crazy here. Okay. I I am so concerned about these teachers. We've gotten some emails. I, I do want to respect the process that you have to go through with a student with an IEP. There, there is a process. And so if it comes and, and we're talking about students and we're talking about staff and this, I think we need to talk to legal. If, if we're going to go down this road, it needs to be, I, I believe this needs to be a closed session item. Um, and but 
again, this, this is something that I think the staff has heard. We're very concerned about the safety of our staff and students, but we have to allow them to go through the process. And that process is not something that can happen in this quickly. It doesn't have to necessarily be the full process. It could be external yeah. safeguards, okay? There are other things that could be done. It could be some additional uh, people put in the classroom. It's got a small, uh, a, a large class size. There's a lot of things that could be done. But or even we just don't schedule. want to jeopardize a student's right to FAPE or a process by even the discussion we're having here. We don't want a parent to say, you moved my student because they went to the board meeting. Okay. You, my only you're not, I, I, we need to stop and, and we need to stop. But we can get an update as like, okay, we're moving forward with IEPs or we're doing the process. Madam President, we spent about 15 minutes on something that's not agendized. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that urgency yeah. and I think staff has heard the urgency. We but I'm trying to vote on a motion and I want to make sure that we understand what the motion is saying. Only I will only vote is it's clo closed session. Well, it, it, there's nothing that says it's open or closed. It just report back to us. It, it, you, we make it closed if it's appropriate. Just, just for clarification, we have a motion based on an unagendized issue. For, ag for, for agendizing, you can do For that. agendizing. Jim, it's not a violation. That's one of the few things you can. It's written right in the agenda. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Okay, so the request is to have a report about SPED, uh, special ed safety issues at the next meeting. And it was made by Trustee Ratterman, seconded by Trustee Lieberman. Do I have that right? Okay, so um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 I heard three. Those uh, against? I, ha no. I, I, mean, uh, I haven't voted. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just waiting for Trustee Fritchup. You can abstain if you. There's three votes for. I don't want any this to be interpreted as I am not concerned about staff safety or student safety, but this is not the appropriate forum for this discussion. And so I'm voting no. Okay, so then that fails three to three. It didn't. miscounted um that was uh trustee fairchild trustee canova and myself against the rest four okay um so i'd like to move on then uh -huh. and we'll um we'll hear when we need what we need to hear okay so we're moving on to item i which is public comment on agendized items so this is a chance to speak uh it's on something that is on the agenda but that you don't wish to stay until we get to it. Um, so if there's anyone in the room who wants to speak on something that's coming up later. Okay, I don't see anyone. I don't have any slips. And if there's somebody on the Zoom who wants to speak now, you need to raise your hand. Okay, I don't see any, so we will move on. Okay, next is uh, consent. Do I have a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second, Rotterman. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee Fairchild, second from Trustee Raderman. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes six to zero. Uh, next one is item K.1, Ed Code Waiver Teacher Instructing Outside of Credentialed Area. Move to approve Fairchild. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee Fairchild, second from Trustee Gonzalez. Any comments from people in the room or on Zoom? Any comments in the room? Uh, from the board. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes six to zero. Uh, the next item is K.2, revised job description, account assistant three, transportation classified. Um, any comments? I have one member of the public who wishes to speak. Ms. Lynn Villarreal, I have a motion to approve. I'll just get that in. Trustee Gonzalez, was there a second? Second. This is account assistant. Account assistant three transportation. Okay, Lynn. I just wanted to clear. Okay. 
I just wanted to clarify in case there was any question that this isn't a new position in the district. Yeah, we know. This is an update of a position that has been vacant for several months now. Um, it was placed, this vacancy has, has placed a considerable strain on the transportation department. And the reason why this is being presented here tonight is that when the previous person left this position, um, it was decided by CSEA as well as management that the job description should accurately reflect the uh, qualifications responsibilities in that role. So it's at the same salary range. It's not gonna affect the budget in any way, but I ask that you approve this and move this forward because the transportation really, really has a big gaping hole that they need filled. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any comment on Zoom? I don't see any. Okay. Uh, then we have a motion from Trustee Gonzalez and a second from Trustee Lieberman. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes six to zero. Next one is K.3, new job description, professional learning specialist classified. I have and a comment. you have a comment. And then um, we'll get to Lynn also has a comment. Go ahead, uh, Trustee Canova. Yeah, this item and the next item are coming back to us. I don't know, is this the third time possibly? I'm not sure. But um, sometimes it's good for us to go back to our board policies and refresh ourselves on what our board policies say. And I'll, I handed out this earlier. I didn't get Jody, one, Jody, one of these. But this is our current policy. So this is policy 4000. And uh, if you scroll down the page, it itemizes what we're supposed to do with new job positions. So item one says the superintendent or designee shall ensure the following steps are followed. And I'll speed through it. Discussion item, planning item, action item. Then item two says presentation to the board of trustees about proposed new positions will include the administrative employee requesting a new position, identified need and or resource gap, as well as existing staff efficiencies and levels. C says measurable relationships of new position to major goal attainment of the district. D, job description, which of course we've had now, this, we're, we had that again, the job description. E says value of the investment, identifying the short and long-term total cost of the new position and whether it is within current departmental budget, other, and this is interesting, other options and their costs must also be presented, which is part of this policy. We're, we're not doing that. Uh, F, item F says, the request must be anchored to strategic priorities of the districts with an explanation of the targeted and quantifiable outcomes. And anyway, you have a copy of it in front of you, but this was, um, this language was adopted by this board not that long ago, it was October of 2019. Mm -hmm. We're not doing this. Um, so that's a problem, you know, so there's a lot of questions here, but this is our existing board policy and uh, either we follow our policy or we, if we don't wanna follow this policy, then I, maybe the, con the conversation would be about changing the policy. But as of tonight, this is our policy. And for me as a board member, I can't, um, I'll frame it a different way. If, if something comes to me through this policy along the way that this is outlined, it makes my job easier as a board member to decide if I wanna support or not support a new job position. So for at least, I'm only one of seven going forward in the future, if these things come to me and they don't come to me within the framework of this policy, my vote's gonna be no. Okay, thank you. Uh, Trustee Churchup. Um, Thanks, Trustee Canova. Um, one of the things that I noticed in glancing through this policy as thank you for bringing us copies, um, it is a sentence and I was part of the policy committee when this was adopted and it's prudent and well-planned expansion protects our students from disruption of service and our employees from unnecessary future reductions. And that's what I think we all, we were talking about for the last couple of board meetings. We're seeing a lot of red in our budget. We don't wanna add positions put them lowest on the totem pole if we think that in the future we're going to be doing, may, maybe not this year, maybe the next year going to be doing layoffs. And, and that sentence just really hit me because we don't want unnecessary future reductions. 
And that's why this policy was put, brought forward. And this was brought forward because there was concern that we were expanding too much and we have continued to add more and more positions. It, it, and I don't know if we have been following this, but you're right and that this is our policy that we need to follow today. <laughs> Okay, uh, we have one member of the public in the room who wishes to speak, uh, Lynn Villarreal. And if there's anyone on Zoom who wishes to speak, now would be the time to raise your hand. I just keep turning up tonight like that bad thing. So um, I spoke on this before, and so I'm once again going to speak about this, this job description of the professional learning specialist. I'm going to reiterate why this is an important position that is desperately needed and long overdue in our district. While we do have some professional learning opportunities for classified staff in some departments related directly to the jobs that they perform, they are often excluded from learning opportunities that should be shared with all district employees. Not because no one see, thinks that this is valuable, that they shouldn't receive this, but because there is no system in place to ensure that this happens. And the majority of classified employees do not receive professional learning that is ongoing, meaningful, and relevant to the positions in which they serve. The professional development for classified employees has not been systematic or equitable. They have long been underserved and overlooked. Just this week, I have had members reach out to me who are struggling to be successful in their positions because of a lack of support and training designed specifically for them. I repeat, all employees of our district deserve professional learning that is coordinated and tied to the critical skill sets that need to be developed to serve our students best. This is especially challenging in the classified world where there is such a wide and diverse set of needs. That is why we need someone who can connect, collaborate, and coordinate with departments and managers to ensure that there is a plan. A person who can support our director of professional learning to ensure ongoing, consistent, and relevant professional development for every single employee in our district. That is why I strongly encourage you to not only approve this job description, but move forward in hiring a classified person who can support her, our professional development director, and ensure equity of treatment for the classified staff who want to be the best that they can possibly be. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other? Um... Move to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion. Question. Once yep. we approve, if assuming we approve this position, can the position be put in place automatically or does it still need to come to the board for approval to fund it? The direction the board gave at the last meeting was that the board would, uh, would inform us when uh, following, the board would give permission when to fly the position basically is what the direction was. So that was done at the last meeting. I'd like to see it included in the, in the motion that we have this meeting for this consistency. <laughs> If there is, I support it. If not, I won't. So the motion is to approve the position and wait for the board's approval to fill the position. Well, I need um, the maker what? of the motion to approve that. Okay. No, that's not that's not the uh, the motion before us. Okay. So the motion is just to approve the position, and and technically you don't need it because we already gave direction about that. Well, unless somebody interprets this to be overriding that, and I think Albert is. Um, I'll need some clarification from Trustee Gonzalez on that. No, I, I think that is correct. I think that basically once you have the new job description, our HR department can go ahead and, and post the position subsequently to that. But what I would say is that a few years ago, our, our uh, previous UTSC president had the foresight to help us in this labor management initiative and really launch that. You know, I just happened to be president that, that year. But it was really it was really um, spearheaded by our, our former UTSU president, and I, th I think he acknowledged the, the fact that our teachers are you know the anchor of, of education educating our, our students, but our classified members are definitely 
at the forefront of that as well. You know, sometimes seeing our students as they get on the bus and dropping them off at the end of the day. And I think that this, this position really uh, goes a long way to make sure that they have the, the professional development, the training that, that's necessary that, as we've heard, was not, and maybe was not covered in the past. So um, yeah, so I, I don't wanna hamstring our, our HR department in not allowing them to flag the position. Jody, I have a comment. Okay, Trustee Canova. Yeah, and, and, I, and I recognize all that, but we're not following our existing policy. That's the problem. So if you want to, if you feel this existing policy is not serving our needs, then say so and have the policy changed. But right now we have a policy we're not following. So what's the, you know, as a board member, I'm questioning what's, what's the point? If we have board policies that we can just decide that we're not gonna follow, what's the point of having the policy in the first place? So, so if you wanna change the policy, put that on the table and, and let that, let it go to committee and let it come back in some new altered fashion. But tonight, this is the policy we have and we're not following the policy. That's a problem. <laughs> This is a point of information. I, I wrote that on the, uh, the policy you gave us to bring it back to the policy committee. I'm also looking at the, the policy and I, I do appreciate you bringing this to us, Trustee Canova. Um, uh, most, if not all of this information, well, maybe most of this information, although they there isn't a specific presentation on it, uh, we did get this information. So um, that in the item, it says that uh, Mr. Gonzalez is bringing this forward from HR. Um, we've heard from our um, union leader about the need for this for, um, for our classified members. There's uh, a goal attainment that's, you know, we wanna support our adults in our district. There is a job description that we have um, look at item E. Uh, so it seems this... like just to, to one second, uh, Trustee Kenova, I just want to want to finish. So value of the investment, identifying the short and long-term total costs of the new position. Um, other and, options. Other options and their costs must that, also be. That has not happened. We have not been presented with other options and the costs associated with those other options. We're not doing that. That's mm -hmm. not happening. That's in this policy. Mm -hmm. That's my point. Okay. Um, Okay, Trustee Canova, did you was there more that you wanted to say? Okay, Trustee Rutterman. Okay, so the reason I made the, I mean, I don't have a problem with the idea behind this position. I think it's been eloquently promoted and with a lot of justifications. But I do sort of feel, I mean, I, I do agree with Trustee Canova here. And something that's been bothering me for a while, I, I just happened to print this out. There's 20 people on this list. This is a list sent to me of all of the all of the management at the district office. Now, this is a while ago, it was Rod Adams was superintendent. There were 20 people, okay? And at that time, our population, student population, was probably greater than it is now, but it's in the same neighborhood as that we have now. And I believe if you look at the similar list to this now, you'll see almost three times that number. I don't know, I have to go look and count it. I just know it's a lot larger number than this. So when you look at the job description, I think it was well done. It, it says, you know, value the investment, identifying short term. I think we need, I think I'm, I'm, and we've fought this up at several meetings in the past. I'm very concerned about the expansion that's taking place. I don't, a lot of it may be necessary. Maybe just in the old days, we just didn't do things right. So we, we, we needed a whole lot more people and just didn't have them. But, but the, I think it's really important that we, go ahead and take a look at our staffing levels at the administrative side of things. And um, so if you'd put, if you had agreed to change the, um, the motion to include what the previous thing, uh, saying that we had to wait for funding till we could get a chance to do this stuff, I'd support it, otherwise I won't. Because I'm, I'm very concerned about how we're spending money. Okay, so I'm gonna suggest that we take a vote and see where it lies because to make uh, unless you want to change the motion but it sounds like you have you didn't want to make the you didn't want to change the motion we should just go ahead um okay trust trustee lieberman say something quickly and then we're we'll go ahead and take the vote um i i 
Trustee Ratterman, you know, I, I take your point on, on expansion and spending money. Um, I think we need to be careful though that we take each case on an individual basis and not make a sweeping generalization for every position that comes to us and dismiss them out of hand out of a desire to not expand the district office. I think that there are some positions that perhaps are needed um, where there is a hole that needs to be filled. Um, and I think that we need to be careful that we don't paint with too broad of a brush over, we're not gonna expand administrative hiring um, without considering whether or not that position is actually a vitally needed one. Um, and, and to me, um, making sure our classified staff feel equitable and have the opportunities for training, self-improvement, professional improvement, and providing the, the services to our students that we want them to, um, I think that this is a position that, you know, maybe, yeah, is, it, is the timing great? No, but I don't think we should necessarily punish the classified staff because they're coming to us with this position at this particular time. Um, so I think, I think we just need to be mindful that we're not sweeping everything into the trash because we're, we're fiscally paranoid. Um, I think hey, you said you're going to be quick. I know I'm trying to be quick, but I, 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 I okay. I just, I just want to, I'm trying to say, I get what you're saying, but we need to make sure that we're not just saying no to everything because we don't want to add positions that are necessary. We, we need to think. Okay. I'm done. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and if we um, want to go forward and make sure that this policy is being done to the letter, we should do that. We should give direction that that, that is the case because our policies are our policies. I, I hear you on that. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and take a vote on uh, what we have, which is um, approving the um, uh, approving the, the job description of professional learning specialist. So. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And all those opposed? No. Okay, so that fails three to three. Um, I'd like to make a motion. Yeah. I'd like to make the motion to approve the position as described with the understanding that before it could be funded or put into place, it has to come back to the board for approval to fly it or whatever phrase you want to use. Okay. Doesn't look like I'm getting a second. second. Oh. Okay, so we have um, a motion from Trustee Ratterman and a second from Trustee Fairchild to approve it, um, uh, approve the job description, but don't fly it yet until we get board approval. Right? Is that what you said? I believe approve it, so. but don't and fly it. Jim was asking me if this is in the framework of the policy. To my understanding, yes, because before you actually fund the thing, it has to go through the process that's in the policy. So, so um, do you want to see this information come back then before we'll, uh, we'll fly it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. If you really want to know what I want to see, I want to see us we're going to approve the position. I think it's well done. I think they've come up with a good idea. And then what I want to see us bring back is we need to have a talk about, we need to have a talk before we fund anything else about what's there. And I agree, we don't do a broad brush. We have to specifically look at what's there. This may well be on the top of the list to fund, but we're having this stuff come in a little piecemeal without looking at it globally. And without looking at this thing globally and, 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 and balancing this or in the next job or the following job after that, and how it affects the district as a whole and whether the value bang for the buck is there, I think that's a mistake. And because I think we have significant uh, uh, creep and it's something that almost all organizations have and have to fight against because after all, after a while you end up with all kinds of people doing jobs and you ask, well, why are they doing them? And half the time, because that's what we do. 
I think we are, I think we are overstaffed at the moment. And, and I'm inclined to support this, but again, we got, we have to follow our policy. Now right. you, you can change the policy if you want to. That's a separate issue. But right now, we need to follow this policy. And part of it, it says, you know, the part that really stands out for me is other options and their costs must also be presented. That's part of this. That's not happening. I need to see that, you know. And I may very well support this. I'm going to support this motion. But um, but when it comes back to funding it. I want to see the policy honored, or if it's a preference of a majority of this board, change the policy. We could probably vote. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Then we have a motion to approve it, but um, wait on uh, filling it until the board approves. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So that passes six to zero. Okay. Moving on. Uh, item. K.4, new job description, special assistant to the superintendent. Do I have a, oh, we have a presentation of uh, information. I do have some information. Mm -hmm. I wanted to report um, the process we have taken to uh, bring these job descriptions to you. Um, so this is the third time uh, that we bring the uh, job description. We had one January 13, January 24th, and then today as an action. And you did state in a previous board meeting that uh, it will be approved, uh, uh, but not to post until you had a discussion for that. Uh, we started doing the research for this role of a special assistant to the superintendent or chief of staff, as known in other districts, uh, back in November, and received input from executive cabinet in the beginning of January. It was also brought to cabinet uh, in the same month. We looked at different... Uh, um, uh, articles, some from Forbes Magazine, the Harbor Business Review, and the benefits of this of this uh, role uh, to our superintendent is in, in regards to time, uh, allowing her to have uh, the availability to be out in the community, uh, available to us also um, for planning, um, or just having that uh, time, uh, they phrased as uh, white time in order to, uh, to strategize. Uh, it would also allow uh, for improved flow of information, effective decision making, and uh, identifying and reducing cost, uh, and also the boost of, of an impact in regards to our strategic plan. Uh, we have very ambitious goals uh, in our district. We want to become um, the best district in California. We want to become a role model, actually role leading district. And this role supports our superintendent in achieving this role. We also conducted research uh, by looking at various job descriptions from other similar uh, districts. We looked at Fresno Unified School District, Riverside Unified School District, Ontario Montclair School District, St. Paul Public Schools, and two other districts um, outside of the state, one in New Jersey. We also changed, and I want to re uh, remind you, we changed the role of the previous executive assistant to the superintendent to that of administrative confidential secretary with the idea of having two individuals serving the superintendent's office as it occurred in prior years. Um, this position is a coordinator range uh, from $171,000 to 201. If you look at the uh, job description, the theme overall is, is being a, a strategic and, and uh, project management, which would allow our superintendent and our district to minimize some of those uh, uh, contracts we have uh, with our with, the, with consultants in order to to take over those um, those roles and and the big but the biggest value in itself that this position brings is allowing our superintendent to have uh, the freedom of time. Sometimes it's difficult to to get time uh, with her because she is you know answering emails or or working in, 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 you know, in things that could be done by this person in this role. Thank you. Okay, uh, Trustee Canova. Your presentation did not include other options and their costs. Do you, do you have other options and their costs besides the, doing this? The, because that's our policy, you know. Correct. Uh, the, the other options, um, and I think the way we have been addressing this other options is by uh, bringing in uh, outside consultants. Uh, 
which is something that we want to minimize, right? Uh, we want to cut that down. Uh, and so either that or other options would be, um, you know, to continue spreading that into other, uh, you know, other staff members already in the district. The cost. Well, the cost is in, in terms of time. Um, I mean, it will be the savings of this entire uh, position, right? Uh, but it's it's the uh, the additional workload to to everyone else in uh, in like an executive cabinet, right? But it's not defined because that's not part of your presentation. I'm not trying to be an annoying person here. Typically, I'm not, but we have a policy. Am I making my point, guys? Yes, Am I making my point? Okay, trust me. So can I just make, can I just say that I'd like to pull this item. We will come back to the next meeting with a presentation outlined uh, by board policy 4000 so that it's clear. Uh, we've had conversations in with, uh, with board members. I've had conversations through um, when I made the suggestion about the redesign the superintendent's office. So now let's, let's put it for the public to see. So everybody is clear about this. So I'd like to ask the board president, if she please pull item K4 to bring back at the next board meeting, and we will have a presentation that is aligned with board policy 4000, and so that it's clear about the redesign. Thank you. Okay, I'm fine with that. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Did you have a question about it? Yeah, talk. Go ahead. One of the things that uh, we, there's a lot in this board policy, but one of the things we've asked for continually as a board for a few years is just kind of an org chart. We are so top heavy um, and we're talking about losing um, people at sites and we're talking about adding people here. That makes no sense in my brain. And um, Trustee Raderman talks about zero-based budgeting. We saw a presentation with lots of red and you say, well, other people are gonna have to do the job. We've never had so many other people that walk these halls in our entire existence as a school district. We've never had so many people at the district office in our entire existence as a school district and we have declining enrollment. Okay, can we uh, pull this? Uh, yes. One? Okay, so um, Dr. Kemp, are you gonna be able to put that together by the next meeting? Uh, if, if we don't get it done, this, if we don't get it done, we'll bring it to the beginning of March. We're good with this. Okay. Uh, then we will move on. Uh, item K.5, ratification of the appointment of the vice principal at McDonald High School. Second, Fair Charlotte. Okay, I have a motion from Trustee Gonzalez and a second from Trustee Fairchild. Would you like to tell us who the winner is? Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to introduce- For the record, we actually know, we're not just yeah, making a blind approval. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I would like to introduce Rick Hayashi. Uh, Rick received his Bachelor of Science in Psychology from California State University, Long Beach. His credential in educational administration from San Jose State and his master's in school counseling and marriage family therapy from San Francisco State. Rick is coming to Santa Clara Unified School District from Campbell Union High School District, where he has been the assistant principal at Westmont High School. Some of his responsibilities included he supervised and mentored over 20 teachers as they identified specific content standards that students needed in order to succeed in high school. He created a summer bridge program open to all incoming ninth graders from feeder schools. He developed a master schedule that provided smaller learning environments for students transitioning back to in-person learning. He identified alternatives to suspension through restorative practices, individual and group counseling, coordination with outside agencies, and parent participation resulting in zero school suspensions in the fall of 2019-2020 school year. It's a welcome to Santa Clara Unified School District, Rick Hayashi, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so we can go ahead and vote on this item. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes six to zero. We are going to take a short break now before we head into this next section. So um, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes.
we um, ready to resume? Thank you. Okay, we are up to item L.1, <coughs> acceptance of the 2020-2021 independent auditor's report and financial statements for the period ending June 30th, 2021. Move to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee Gonzalez and a second from Trustee Lieberman. Do you have a presentation? Uh, we have uh, prepared remarks from our auditor. So uh, we have, uh, this is our first year um, with our new audit firm, Ide Bailey. Um, as the trustees know, we went out for an RFP after many years and selected a new audit firm. And so with us this evening uh, to talk about the district's financial audit for the period ending June 30th, 2021, is Mr. Nathan Edelman. He is from Ide Bailey. And so I will turn it over to Nathan. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Um, I guess, good evening. I, I won't take too long. I don't, I don't need to go through all of my, uh, my PowerPoint slides, but just to summarize the results of the audit and actually the purpose of the audit, and actually even before that, my name is Nathan Edelman with Ide Bailey, and I am the independent external auditor the whole purpose of the audit is to ensure that the accounting records that the, the financial statements comply with the governmental accounting standards. And then we also look at, at federal grant compliance. The single audit is a, you know, a slew of federal money that's flowing through all these school districts this year. And whether or not the district is using that for its intended purpose is part of the audit. We have basically what's called clean or unmodified opinions on, on the financial statements, as well as on the, on the compliance. I saw, <clears throat> I saw in the, um, I think on the, on the agenda, it does mention there are two state compliance findings. Those are honestly very minor things. Um, if you wanted to talk about them, we, we could, but it, clean opinion on the financial statements. There's no internal control issues. So it's really a very boring, um, very simple thing to, to talk about. I guess not a whole lot for me. Only other thing that I would add, a first year audit is, I mean, any audit, and especially the first time that you know, it's my first time as auditor, it's a very invasive process for the folks at the district, for the for the, the folks on the business side who are responsible for supporting the audit. And they went, they bent over backwards and they, they a lot of effort on their part and they deserve a lot of credit for really being able to give us everything that we needed to finish, um, finish in time and to, and to get this thing out the door. So I'm happy to take any questions from the, the group. Um, Otherwise, I will I'll give you back your time. I saw I had like 40 minutes on the um, on the agenda and I can I can go on if you want, but I'll turn it over to the group. And if there's any questions, I have to try and take them as, as best I can. Thank you very much. And actually, you don't get the full 40 minutes. Sorry. So um, we have another item <laughs> under well. the 40 minutes. Um, OK, uh, any other um, thoughts, Mr. Shale? I just want to say uh, it was really a pleasure working with Nathan through this process. Um, he's right. Um, bringing in a new auditor for the first time can be very invasive. Um, I would liken it a little bit to having somebody come into your house and opening up a drawer and having them go through that drawer. Um, and you get to pick what that drawer is. We don't get to pick that drawer. Um, so they're looking at everything. But um, Debbie Jones and her staff did an amazing job through this audit. Um, so I echo Nathan's comments on that as well. The only other thing that I'd like to point out, and this, this talks about the importance of why you change auditors as well, is becomes, because sometimes auditors find things that the previous auditors didn't find. And so one of the things that's not in the audit report, but it's in the management letter that's also attached to the agenda item as well, talks about um, this uh, statement in there about $734,000 and how it was coded. That had nothing to do with the district. That was about an error made by a prior auditor. Um, and so it's because of bringing in these auditors and having a fresh set of eyes, making sure that our financial statements are clearly presented and making sure that we correct those errors. So that's kudos to Nathan and his team for catching an error that was made by the prior auditor. Um, and again, those things happen. It's not a, a question against their, their judgment either. Um, it's just the importance of making sure that we're doing everything that we can to get things cleared up and, and stated as accurately as possible. 
Okay, thank you so much. Um, any questions or comments from the board or from the public or from the Zoom public? I see no hands right. raised. There's uh, one real quick Trustee question. Ryderman, can you question I'd like to ask the auditor, and it's beyond the scope of this a little bit, and that is when you, and I've asked this of other auditors as well, this audit has a very specific scope and purpose, but in the process of doing it, sometimes you say, oh, you know, there's some areas here where you might want to take a look at. Um, did you have anything that you saw here, a different type of audit or anything else where you'd say, hey, as a good fiscal stewards of the district, there is something you ought to just, just take a look at. It looks like it's good, but you ought to do this audit or you ought to do take a look at it a different way. Did you see anything like that? Um, I, I'm probably not gonna be able to give you a, a, a great answer. So there's something, there's internal control deficiencies that would be reported if things meet certain thresholds about the process that the district is going through in order to, either ensure grant compliance or to ensure that the accounting records are correct. Those internal control deficiencies would be the auditor saying things need to happen differently. And there was nothing that that kind of rose to that level. There's maybe, and I don't, I don't have a listing on, off the top of my head, but there's a number of just smaller things that we would talk about over the course of the audit could be involving workers' compensation. I, there's the, the two component units here. Um, these are probably the things that just stand out to me, but um, things that would take time to implement because you kind of identify them in the first year and then folks in the district have to actually act upon those. And those would kind of shake out over the course of the next cycle. So on that was the, the teacher housing's included in the audit. And my suspicion is you're using data that was provided by the there's no, I mean, we were just, the data was provided to you. And so it all balances. Um, but is there a, when we have outside agencies working with us, there that's ones I worry about. So teacher housing, there is an outside group that controls a lot of that and provides the numbers. It, would you have picked up if there were any problems in that? Yeah, so I should, maybe I should clarify a little. There, there There's two component units. I guess the term component unit, it's a, it's a Gatsby term, but Teacher Housing Foundation, and then there's also the Teacher Mortgage Assistance Foundation. The Housing Foundation was actually audited by someone else. It's a kind of a, it's pretty normal. We have a, I guess, a component auditor. Obviously, those two things are separate external agencies, and they have we we received their audit opinion. Their audit opinion was a cleaner, unmodified audit opinion. So I wasn't directly involved with the Housing Foundation audit, uh, although I mean it's you know it, I guess it's um, an outside agency that's handling the accounting, and I guess that's where there there could be concerns because you don't have I guess the direct involvement of folks at the district, but they did have a separate audit, and that was also an unmodified I guess you'd say a clean audit opinion. For the Mortgage Assistance Foundation, that one, we actually did the audit. It's very little activity. There's actually nothing on the income statement. And it's, you know, it's a million dollars or whatever, 1.1, if I recall, which is su subject to just confirmation with the bank. Um, so there's not, not, not much more that I guess can happen with that one. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. If I, if I could provide a little bit more context on that. Sure. Um, on the Teacher um, Housing Foundation, um, in accordance with their individual and separate bylaws, they're required to have a separate audit, annual audit. So as he said, it did go through an audit. They all, The Housing Foundation also issued an RFP and selected a new auditor for the first time in about 20 years. And so a new auditor was, and, and through that process, we identified some day-to-day -day accounting systems and, and processes that need to be changed. And so in my capacity as chief financial officer of that organization as well, um, I'm going to be working with that board to improve the accounting systems that are in place uh, to improve that as we move forward uh, to clean that up. Excellent, because those are the places the boogeymen hide. Thanks. Okay, thank you. If there isn't any others, we'll, uh, questions, we'll take a vote on this. I have a motion from Trustee Gonzalez, second by Trustee Lieberman. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes six to zero. Thank you. Okay.
Thank you, everybody. Okay, next item is thank you. L. L dot. Yes, thank you very much to our auditor. Uh, L.2, agreement with HY Architects for a district-wide facility conditions assessment and long-range master plan. Do I have a motion? I, I think we have a slide presentation, don't we? Oh, yes. I believe we do. I, yeah, I can take a motion now if you want. Um, Let's do the slide presentation. First. Okay, sure. So to tee it up a little bit, we do have a slide presentation. I know that Joe's bringing it up. Um, so we have a presentation this evening to talk about what is a facilities condition assessment and what is a district-wide master plan process. So uh, we got Miss Michelle Healy, who is going to be providing that presentation. We also have uh, Larry Adams here also to talk about some historical information from the past, if it's necessary to have those conversations. Also with us this evening by Zoom is a representative from HY Architects, uh, Mr. Lee Pollard. And he can also talk about what the process looks like in that regards as well. Um, and then after the presentation, we're available to answer any questions. Michelle? Good evening, board. Um, I will try to make this informative and semi-brief uh, since it is getting late. Um, so, Joe, can you go to the first slide? Oh, never mind. Sorry. All right. So tonight I'm going to discuss two items that um, we have issued an RFP for. And one is a facilities condition assessment. And the other one is a facilities master plan. And they're very different documents, but they go together um, pretty much seamlessly in our planning for the future. So the facilities conditions assessment is an evaluation that a third party would do because of their expertise, which in this case would be an architect and engineers. And they would go through um, having looking at all of our HVAC units and looking at our fields and looking at everything that we need or that we already have installed, establishing a lifetime for those units and letting us know then when they might need to be replaced. And so they're looking at physical issues, they're looking at ADA issues that we need to identify and fix. They're looking at codes that we need to, things that we need to update in our bathrooms, in just our walkways, parking lots, and they're looking to, for this to provide us information on what we need to routinely maintain as well as maintain in the future. And so this facilities condition assessment is really important because it provides a life cycle cost for all of the equipment and facilities in the district, and it provides a future budget. So what we're looking at especially for this, is getting a synthesis of, and, and really an Excel, but it'll be in a much broader sense, but all of those HVAC units that the bond office put in in 2014, those were 144 units. HVAC units have about a 25 year lifespan. So some will need to be replaced before, some will need to be replaced after. But in 20 years, we're going to need to be replacing 144 HVC units. So if we don't start planning for that now and knowing that that cost is going to come in 20 years, we're not going to be able to afford it. The same thing goes with all of these artificial turf fields we're putting in. We know that they last about 10 to 12 years. So in the future, we need to be planning for maintenance to be able to replace those fields in the future. And that's all of Agnew Elementary, all of Puerta Middle School, McDonald, and the two high schools, Santa Clara and Wilcox, both have artificial turf fields and tracks, and those will all have to be resurfaced. So it's really important for us to have a deferred maintenance plan, and that's what the facilities condition assessment does. It looks at fire alarms, it looks at roofing, it looks at all the systems in all of our schools and makes sure that we have a management plan set for them for the maintenance department on a yearly basis. So every year we know we're gonna spend this much on filters. And, and unfortunately our district doesn't have one of these plans. Most districts do. In fact, I would say 100% of districts do, except we don't. So um, it's something that we've been working on and trying to get. We did do an exterior facilities assessment um, 
And we did that with Verde and Kitchell, and we spent one-time dollars on that. And so we have the information for a lot of our exterior facilities, but we don't have the information for our buildings. And so that's what the conditions assessment will do. The next item that um, basically takes some of the facilities condition assessment and weaves it into the master plans, and that's the facilities master plan. And we're looking to do this district-wide. And it's a comprehensive long-range plan that will be a roadmap for what happens for capital improvements on every single one of our sites. So we're doing this right now at Patrick Henry for the new Laurelwood campus at Peterson. We're doing it at Bracker, Briarwood, and Westwood. And we're also doing it at Scott Lane. And so these this facility master plan is going to analyze every single one of our sites. It's gonna, every single one of our sites, including Martinson, including Monticello and Curtis, we're gonna evaluate what could potentially go on those sites, what we could use it in the future if we're going to need it in five years, in 10 years. And it also looks at all of the, it takes into consideration that facilities condition. Oh, sorry, Joe, I'm three slides. Oh, sorry, it's my, my fault. Just kidding. <laughs> All right, so uh, going into um, the facilities condition assessment, sorry for everybody watching on YouTube. Um, I went the wrong way. So why is a facility master plan important? It's important because it allows us to accomplish our strategic vision. And I want the board to understand that we, during this master planning process, we will be following the same process that we are doing with Peterson and Laurelwood, that we're doing with Bracker, Briarwood and Westwood, <laughs> and that we're doing with Scott Lane. We will have community outreach. We will have district staff, students, parents and community input committees for every single school. So everything that we're doing, the conversations we're having with you, the conversations that we're doing virtually right now, because we can't do anything in person with the community, the outreach that we're doing, we, will, we would be doing that with every single school over the next 18 months. So we use the information from the condition assessment and incorporate that into the facilities plan and the master plan. And we take that information back to the site so that we know if we're gonna to have to replace a roof on a building, an HBC on a building, and the building isn't achieving what it needs to achieve for our student success, that that building may be up for demolition and rebuild reconstruction sooner in the master plan rather than later. It creates a prioritized phased capital facility plan. So each school site would be phased and the phase one would be what the school site determines is the most important things that need to be done first on that site. And then it's phased. And so we phase these master plans. Usually elementary schools are around three to four phases. High schools, most of our high schools now have a lot of new things. So they would potentially have less phases, but they could have more phases just because they're larger. And the school site then would tell us what these deficiencies are. And this is, it's analyzing each campus on a holistic approach instead of piecemealing it and saying, we know that some roofs need to be replaced. We know windows need to be replaced, but looking at what the school needs and incorporating all of that in the vision of vision 2035. So in order to accomplish this, we, oh, ahead of myself. Um, so why do this now? Thank you. Uh, why do this now and not later? Right now we are embarking on vision 2035 and we are having big discussions about parity, about equity, about special education, how we want our future graduates to perform and how we want their facilities to be and to encompass this eventual graduate portrait that we're doing and our staff portrait and our community portrait, our systems portrait. Every aspect of Vision 2035 can really be incorporated 
into a facilities master plan. So it'll create an inventory of projects for future funding. We are looking at several years down the road when the state passes another bond, which they will, um, we're looking at getting reimbursement from OPSC for some of the, for the schools that we built at Agnew and Huerta. And that will be extra income that we'll be able to use on other capital facilities projects. We have additional savings that's coming from Measure BB and Larry's bond program. And we'll need to have some idea of what the schools need so that we can prioritize which projects should go first with that remaining money after all of the allotted projects have been completed. This process, I know there's been a lot of conversation about New Valley and where we, we should move it. That would also be included in this process. We would get community input. We would reach out, see what we think New Valley is gonna be in the future. And we would analyze all of our existing sites to include that and create that conversation with the community, with the district and everyone else. So this is really a best practice. Um, I mean, I think the majority of school districts have these. It's, it's what leads them through for maintenance and facilities and capital improvement projects. It allows us to go out for grants um, knowing that something that one aspect of a school site is really important and it allows us to look specifically for grant money for that. And it just allows the district to have a roadmap for capital facilities. So we are not including in the master plans. Thank you. I don't know why I'm forgetting this tonight. Um, we're not including in the master plans, Agnew, Huerta, McDonald, obviously, the Peterson campus, Briarwood, Bracker, Westwood, and because we're doing those now, but they would be as those condition assessments that we're doing with these master plans will be incorporated in the final document. And the master plans that our current architects are doing will also be incorporated in that final master plan document. In order to um, get the architect then that we selected to do this project for us, we issued an RFP for new, a new pool of architects in 2020, and the board approved a short list of architects for us. Earlier this year, I issued an RFP to three of the architects who are currently working on master plans for us. And so we, we like working with them. We like their process. We feel that they engage the community correctly. And so we issued the RFP to the three architects. And we received three proposals, as you can see the costs from the three proposals. And we evaluated them based on their staff ability, their past performance, as well as the total project cost. The tentative timeline for us is to move through this and launch, we would originally start the priority list. So which schools do we want to go first? Do we want Cabrillo, Bowers, Pomeroy, Ponderosa, some of these schools that haven't seen much from any of the bond, Hughes, Montague. Do we want to master plan those first? We would pick a few to go first. We would start our facilities conditions assessment on those and then right away also start talking to the school sites, interviewing people, doing more surveys, doing community meetings, and so we would then plan over the summer, come back in the fall and follow up with more master plan meetings. Then we would start to roll into some more projects. We are, our goal is to have the entire process done by December of 2023. And that would allow us, we, I'm anticipating the state to go out for another statewide bond, if not in November, then they would go out for a statewide bond in 2024. And so that would allow us then in 2025 to receive the refunding for some of the Agnew property and projects that we did. And that would allow us to then fund some of these other projects. And I'm here to answer questions. President Muirhead, before we launch into a discussion, um, it's 
almost 10 15. Yes, it is. So we need to look at um, extending our meeting. So just one digression for just a moment so we can figure out how much time we need. Um, we don't have, uh, oh, we still have some more things. Yeah. So we've got, um, we've got about two hours. Oh, in closed session. That's right. Two and a half. So till one o'clock. Somebody want to make a motion to, for one o'clock? We have to go back to but we can end earlier. We can always end early if we move quickly. Make a motion to one to stay open to one. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee Ratterman. Second from Trustee Lieberman. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 No. And any opposed? Okay, so that passes five to one. But keep in mind that that's very late. So let's try and move things along. Okay, so we are back here and um, I'm going to Trustee Canova first. Yeah, the first thing I wanted to say is this is the best presentation I've had on this. My mindset was in a different place coming here tonight and you've changed my mindset. So I just want you to know this is the best presentation that I've had on this. Thank you. Uh, I had a conversation with Stella earlier this week about this. And the one thing that, that I need to, there's two, I really have two questions. I don't want to belabor things. But my first question, and Stella's aware of this because we had a conversation. In this slide presentation, it says that the Fuerte Diagnos and McDonald are not, they're not included in the slide presentation. But if you look at the RFP and the other documentation, it is. And so my first question would be really for you. My second question will be for Larry. And, and so you know what that's gonna be. It's a super simple, easy question. Maybe you guys can do it together. But d does the Agnes campus today have no deferred maintenance plan? There, there's no deferred maintenance plan in place at the Agnes campus? No. And Larry is saying there's not. Wait a minute, can we have someone come to the right. mic? Well, then you so, answer, then so you answer my question. So deferred maintenance comes from maintenance. The bond doesn't cover deferred maintenance. And then, and then I'm going to get back to the other thing I have. Just, okay. just quickly, there's no, there's been no maintenance deferred. It's a brand new campus. So. Okay, so so what's Good outlined definition. here, it, it it jives with you that that this is something we need. That's what I'm hearing from you. Do they have the life cycle? Okay, okay, I, that was, that's important to me to hear that from Larry. The the other question that I have for for you really is it, because it's not included in the slide presentation but it was included in the RP and the other documentation. So that seems like a change in the scope of work. So is there a savings here that can be realized because it's not, it doesn't include the Agnes campus. Is there a savings here that we can? So we did identify in an, um, and I didn't include um, the addendum to the RFP, but um, all of the architects were aware that we would not be master planning these campuses, um, that they would only be doing the incorporation of those campuses into the document so and and they all three architects since we're working with them right now they are all very aware of which architects are working on which campuses um and so they all and i can let lee um speak to this but um they were all aware that those campuses would only be incorporated in the final product that there wouldn't be any work that they would need to do so there's no savings to be realized no. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Trustee Redmond. Sure. So I love the idea of the master planning for the district. I think it's something that's very much overdue. I think it's something we've actually been doing over the years. As a matter of fact, I have some pretty good evidence of it. I have the 2004 draft, which, by the way, does talk about expanding and providing additional information, additional space for the music room. So I'm not sure exactly what happened in there. I'm also looking at its 2009 long range facilities planning document. And I'm sitting here with another one that was 2000, uh, 2018. Uh, so what are the school district's critical things? What are the specifically facilities need? So part of the reason I'm bringing up those past things is we've done a lot of long range planning. We may not have had the uh, 
life cycle costs in there. Matter of fact, I can tell you we didn't because it's something that we haven't done. It's something I've been, been asking for. Matter of fact, I will, one of my sub questions in here is, is IT included in this life cycle cost? Because that's something that I think we really need to be on top of. But I'm wondering if there was some compromise in this process. Most of these were done primarily in-house, okay? Having outside expertise from the LP architecture, whichever architecture firm it is, is, is valuable. But when I look at a $600,000 cost, I'm starting to get very, very um, nervous about that, okay? Because I think there's probably a lot of that work that they're doing that we should be doing or could be doing with existing sunk costs. Um, and by sunk costs, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but if we're paying somebody a salary, we're going to pay it whether they're doing work or not. So I, I, um, that's my concern. I'm about out of time, but maybe you could address some of those issues that I came up with. Yes. So the district has done facility needs assessments before, but they've never really done a long range master plan to the depth that this one will do. So in reviewing all of the past long range master plans, and Larry can speak to this too, it has been more of a needs assessment. It was looking at what needs to be done. And it was looking, it wasn't looking at each site holistically. It was looking at what are the greatest needs that we need. It was looking at the one, especially from 2010, looked at purely looked at enrollment. So it was saying that we are going to have this much enrollment. And so we need two more classrooms at Pomeroy in two years. And then we'll need another um, classroom at Pomeroy in five years because of potential residential and development growth. What those plans didn't do as much as this plan will do and what the expertise of HY architects is, is that they have done this on other sites. It's, it's reaching out to the community. It's incorporating the analysis from the conditions assessment, which none of us have the expertise to do. Um, we can't look at an HVAC unit and determine all of the data that we need to know for this. We, one, staff doesn't have the bandwidth to do it. Um, we've been trying in-house to do this for since we did the um, exterior assessment and we just haven't had enough time and or expertise. And this one really encompasses a whole look at incorporating vision 2035, which is something that we didn't have before. So in these conversations, we're, we're discussing with Mr. Stam and Ms. Knavel, and we're looking at new ways of thinking, new ways of teaching, and then how to incorporate that in a phased plan on the school sites. So that when we look at the, the master plans, and I, I should have brought one to show you. So it's phased because you can't say, I want to build a new multipurpose but I want to put it in this location and there's portables there. So the master plans will be phased so that we know exactly what work has to be done during before something can be built. So if we need to move portables to another location or if we need to demolish something because something's going to go there, we know then that we have to replace that somewhere else first. And that's something that none of our previous plans did. They didn't take into account what was existing and, and really looking at the flow of the campuses, looking at it, they were more of the parking lot needs to be better. So we're gonna just look at the parking lot. It, it looked at everything very um, individually instead of looking at the campus as a whole and discussing with the campus, the site, the students and the community, what they need and how we can accomplish that with either the facilities that we have and modernizing them or planning for new buildings and then figuring out where they go and that phasing. Okay, so I, I'm out of time. If you would indulge me, I'd love to follow up on that. It's up to the, Can we come back to you? No problem. Yeah, make a note. Don't forget what you said. Okay. <laughs> I can't guarantee that. Trustee Fairchild. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Um, one of the things that I have echoed a lot is timing. And I see this as something that 
is not urgent for today, but something that could, and you might say, oh, it's, it's urgent. There's, there's a lot of things that are in my mind, more urgent than a 25 year master plan or 20 year master plan. And as a parent and as someone who's been living through this pandemic with little bodies in school and big bodies in school and knowing the bandwidth of parents and staff, I see a plan that has it starting with all these meetings in March. The, the bandwidth isn't there, guys. And I don't know how to explain that we need to pause things for a year. Let people get through everything. We just finished Omicron, hopefully, you know, and, and just timing. It's, it's like we can't, I don't know why we can't just focus on 2022. And, and I'm all for a master plan. That's great. It's not the right time for us to plow forward and we're going to have our staff meetings and our parent meetings. This is not the right time for this. I wish also that it feels like we're doing this agenda item out of order because this is our first presentation and we're supposed to vote on it. And um, so I, I, I'm out of time, but timing. <laughs> Um, so can I, I can, um, we can, this, we were planning because we, I had basically, I set the timeline because I heard the board wanted us to move forward with Cabrillo. And so I, we can move the timeline back. We can do the facility conditions assessment first and wait until next year to start the master plans. Um, it's, it's that we want to have this started because we are looking at this deferred maintenance. I can, I totally can see the deferred maintenance part portion of this. I wish we had two separate contracts because I cannot support this going forward when it's, it's like, no, sometimes I'm at these meetings. I'm like, is anyone going to the schools and talking to these people that are so tired? Like we've got to respect 2022. I'm 2035. That's great. Woo -hoo -hoo. We're in 2022 and we need to kind of stay here for a while. So um, I, I hear everything that you're saying. I, I do. We worry about that if we don't move with us now, when the time comes to start allocating funds that we have to the next set of projects, because of receding money from the state or leftover funds within Measure BB, or any other restricted funds that are for facilities and capital projects, we won't have the information ready to be able to provide that guidance and that recommendation to the board moving forward. And so by starting now, starting with the conditions assessment and through that process, it allows us to be nimble and ready to provide that information to the board when it's time and at that appropriate time. And so uh, I completely understand why what you're saying. There is, we're also trying to think of making sure that we can provide what is necessary to the board um, when that is available. So just wanted to provide that. Okay. Um, Trustee Gonzalez, and then we'll go back to Trustee Ratterman. So uh, fellow trustees, I know that the community has basically stepped up to uh, give us uh, Quite, quite a lot of funding, right? And they've, they've entrusted us to make sure that, that those projects, those sites have the, uh, that they last a long time. I don't think anybody's gonna wanna go for a bond in two years or four years. I mean, the community has really stepped up. So like we have our IT projects where computers are usually, I know companies do, do it over a three year life cycle and then they replace things. We're, we're looking at this and obviously this is a lot of work. You know, our, we have a lot of sites. We're a vast district, and uh, I think this is important. Uh, obviously, uh, it's never a good time. I think staff is always, always uh, overburdened. And obviously, COVID has 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 given us a little bit more. But I I, I can't. And I had a a teacher in the household as well. I, I've seen this firsthand. Before COVID, you can't tell me that people are not 
you know, stretched. So I don't think it's ever a good time. I think it's just something that we have to do. And, and I think that, you know, as far as, uh, I mean, the, the funding, I think that it's, if we don't do it, I, I could just, we need to make sure that we, we understand what's coming down the pipeline and how we can, you know, have deferred maintenance or maybe even add to deferred maintenance to make sure that we cover these, uh, these different projects. So it's just something that we have to keep our eye on. Okay, thank you. Um, Trustee Radner, we'll go back to you. Thank you. So Larry will remember this. We did a major project in 2004. It was a huge uh, facilities needs task force and they did do a lot of things you're talking about. They talked about moving, adding adding things, moving stuff around. I mean, I've got a list of it. It's, it's I, I think 20 pages long. And um, we weren't able to do everything in there because we didn't have the funds to do it all. I think it came a billion something dollars and we, past uh, $300 million, $350 million bond. Um, but one of the things I had hoped to have happen at that time was to have this carry forward and say, okay, well, we got this much done. And to some extent we did, because we came back for a secondary and then we came back with a couple other bonds as well, Jay and then BB. Um, but I would have liked to have seen that progress forward. And it didn't happen, or it, maybe it did happen, I didn't know, but there were intermittent ones in between there. So here's what I'm looking at. I think this is a really important project. I agree with the timing piece. I think the timing piece right now is really horrible. Um, and it may be really needed to be done now, but this is the wrong time to do it. The last time we did it, we got a huge amount of expertise, volunteer expertise. One gentleman I remember, his name is Dante. I thought it was a cool name. The Silicon Valley Power came in and provided an enormous amount of help with it. Um, and we brought different groups in, Green Group, a bunch of different people in. We looked at strategic planning as to like, what would the future of um, teaching look like in 20 years, that kind of thing. So what I would suggest is 600,000 to me right now is a big bite. The timing is a bit tough. I would like to see like a phased project, one that includes bringing in some expertise from the outside uh, to help supplement this process. I think the life cycle is something that's really important. But to be candid, I think a lot of the life cycle stuff can be done in-house. We know how long an HVA system works. We know how long the track works. And we need to just get it in and get it on a schedule and put it, put it forward. Um, so to me, I would like to see this come back as a phased project. And who knows? We may end up doing the entire thing with the one group. And maybe it'll cost slightly more because it went in phases. But I'd rather see it come in that way than what's now. Just because things are so tight and time is so tight, you know, I just don't think it's... I'm, I'm really hesitant because of that. But I don't want, I, I do want to leave this. And I realize I'm over time, but you've done a really good job on this. You've, you've, it, it's an excellent idea. It's something we desperately need. I'm just concerned about some of those other issues I talked about. Thank you. So just one, I want to mention, this is not coming out of the general fund. So yeah. not general fund, capital facilities fund. Um, and two, um, Trustee Rademan, I, I understand what you're saying and what we've done in the past. This district isn't what we were in the past. The community is not what we were in the past. And we really are looking forward. And we are, we are reaching out to some of those people. We're doing it through Vision 2035. We've been talking to a lot of people, looking at what different things could happen. And um, I, I do just on the cost, I do want to say that we you have passed agreements for us to do this at three sites and at one site and then Patrick and then Patrick Henry Peterson Laurelwood. The cost of all of those put together is almost half of what the cost to do all of our school sites is. So there's definitely some economies of scale that we if we start to split this up the cost could be and i think would be a lot a lot more okay um we'll go to jim and then i'll have some words to say you know michelle a little while ago you were describing a um staged approach to this um mm -hmm. could you describe that again uh taking that approach because i think that kind of goes in line with perhaps what andy was suggesting <laughs> Sure, we can absolutely make this take longer. Um, we were trying to do it in a timely fashion, but if you approve the contract tonight, 
we can start the facilities assessment. We can work through that. We can take the temperature of the communities when we come back in the fall. Um, I will say that I have had so many great conversations with the staff of the schools that we are master planning with right now. They get really excited about it and they love sharing. And that's, it's, some of them say it's been the best part of their day because they're actually getting to say things that they love about their school, but what could make it better. Um, and so we can absolutely, I have discussed this with HY architects, we can take longer, the fee will not go up. Um, so we can start our assessment, start that deferred maintenance plan, go through all of our sites, take the temperature of the, some of the schools, we wouldn't start it all at once, but we could start to do it slowly um, in the fall, depending on where we are with COVID and how the school district and staff and students are feeling. So um, I had um, a question that's kind of related to that. And that is um, in the schedule, it talks about determine the order of the master plans and place the schools in groups. Um, how do you see determining that order? That would be from a discussion between um, maintenance and the bond office, Mark, and we would look at a lot of the schools that didn't get a lot in the bond. Um, and those would be consideration for the top. We can take feedback from the board. Um, I think Mark wants to add something to that. But <laughs> it can be it, it can be flexible. I mean, really, what we're we're looking at a lot of schools that didn't get a lot in the bond, but yet, right? So, they got playgrounds. We have still a lot of Title I schools that didn't get anything. Um, Pomeroy, Scott Lane's only getting a parking lot because of deferred maintenance money. So Scott Lane is being master planned and they're only getting the parking lot. But I think that we have an opportunity to fund some of these projects with remaining Measure BB funds after our current projects are done. And so as Mark said earlier, it allows us to to have a menu of different projects that we can put together so we can see what's most needy that wasn't specifically identified in BB. So it can be Bowers and Pomeroy and Hughes and Montague and the schools that that really only got shade structures and and um, they did all get HVC units, so that was great. Um, but shade structures and playgrounds. Um, Mark, did you want to add something? And then I'll finish. I'll do. The only thing I wanted to add to that because I don't even know why I'm standing up here. She's done such an amazing job tonight. Um, and but the the piece that I would add is obviously we've heard a lot of comments about Cabrillo over the last several months. So obviously, it's been our intent that Cabrillo would be on the top of the list in regards to the conditions assessment. Um, the other thing that we recognize as well is that we have some district assets that we have not looked at in quite some time. And we have an obligation to those closed campuses and, and looking at what is it that we need to do on those closed campuses and what are the needs on those as well. That also assists us in our evaluation of one of the projects in Measure BB is uh, what are we going, where's the new New Valley going? Um, and so through that analysis and looking at the closed campuses, that's going to provide us additional analysis as well. So um, I would, I, it, it, this is not a finalized list uh, by any stretch of the imagination, we would have more conversations, but I think we obviously need to look at Cabrillo. We need to look at the, our, our three campuses and then also look as everything that Michelle said as well and come up with a logical priority for that conditions assessment. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, the other question I had was, that we've borrowed all this money for BB. And I know we're having a discussion about BB later in the agenda, hopefully tonight. Um, but I'm wondering, um, do, do we have any obligation to use that money? I thought there was some rule about we have to use that money in a certain amount of time. Um, at, all the bonds. I will let Mark. Yeah. So, so do we have some urgency because of that? Yes and no. Um, so we've only sold half of the bonds so far. We haven't sold the second half of the bonds. Um, so we've been holding off on that second allocation of bonds. So that way we are ready to break ground on that next set of projects. So that way we don't start that clock too soon. Um, so that is, uh, there is an urgency from the standpoint of once we sell those bonds, making sure that we spend the money within the statutory regard timeline. 
but the urgency hasn't started yet on the second allocation of bonds because we haven't sold them yet. So it's a little bit of chicken and egg a little bit. But the, the bonds remember. that we've already sold, we have that money. We have that money. We are well within the statutory di- deadlines on that. And I think I heard Stella say it's it's three years. Um, I had three years and five years. So I, it's I three, three years. years in mine, mine. Um, but we're well within the deadline and, and the requirements for the original allocation. Okay. I, I do think that this is a good thing to do overall. Um, if we want to slow it down a little bit, to make people happy, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, uh, Trustee Fairchild, and then maybe we can wrap it up. Thanks. Uh, I Again, I, I really struggle, not because I don't think we need some deferred maintenance. I don't think we need um, all the bells and whistles. Uh, our community's not ready for another bond, so just so you know, and the city, as we learned, is probably, I mean, this, we know that the city has talked about how they need um, some, some funding. So um, one of the things that I, I struggle with, and it happens frequently in board meetings, is I feel like we don't always give history the credit it deserves. We identified $1.5 billion of projects. We only went out for $750 million. I can't even believe I just said that in a 720. sentence. 720 in a sentence. So we have identified that there was a significant amount of effort to go into that. The other thing that also keeps being ignored is at that time, it was decided where New Valley would go. And it's in the bond, in the bond projects. And so I, I guess if I would be fine with the, the maintenance, I think we need to make sure we take care of this. But when you go out master planning, it's, it's right before you go out for a bond. I, I think we need to to wait on that. I don't think our community is um, ready for that. And so even though I appreciate the presentation, I think it was well done, but this is not something I can support. Okay, so uh, I'm looking for a motion to approve of some sort. So moved. Uh, Okay, so we have a motion from Trustee Gonzalez. I'd like a, a comment. Um, no, I need a second on the motion. I'll provide a second. Okay, thank you. Um, but uh, I just want to uh, make it clear as far as my position goes. I, I like the idea of the staged approach. So if the board is going to support this, um, that you, ha- you have the freedom to take that staged approach. So that's not the motion that's on the floor. The motion on the floor is to approve the agreement um, as it is. Would um, the maker of the motion be willing to modify that for the staged approach that's been presented to us by Michelle? Uh, I do uh, agree with the staged approach. I think uh, we'll let them work their magic. And uh, if that takes three years, two years, six months, whatever, okay. let, them, let them deal with uh, the staging and getting the, engaging the community and, and what that entails. Okay, so we have um, a motion from Trustee Gonzalez, a second from Trustee Canova to approve the agreement with HY Architects in a staged approach manner. Uh, Trustee Ratterman. Yeah, so I would want to know details on what a staged approach means. I mean, we hit you with that out of the blue. You were very adroit. You managed to adapt to that and come back with some answers that said, yes, we could do that. But there's no specifics in there, and it's because we caught you, you know, right out of the blue. I mean, you shouldn't have specifics. My suggestion, I'm probably going to vote no on this, even though I like the idea of the phased approach, would be to say, let's bring this back at the next meeting with the phased approach delineated so we know what it is we're agreeing to. Otherwise, we're saying, yeah, you can do it. It's a staged approach, you know, and so they'll put eight. They would never do this because I don't think they would disrespect us, but 90% up front and 10% at the back. I mean, you know, so I think we need to know those details before we can move forward. My opinion, that's it. They'll probably give you a yes, so (laughs) go for a vote. Is that something you could come back to us with? I could. Um, My one hesitancy with that firm staged approach, if we bring it back and you vote on it, is that now we're, we have to do that. And if we come back in the fall, and I really hope this doesn't happen, but we're still in COVID, and we all feel like we cannot start these master plans in the fall, or we can't start them, I don't want to be held to that timeline that that staged approach could...
highest too. Cool. I see the gentleman from, I believe it's HL Architects. Is that correct? HY. HY. My apologies, sir. Maybe he has a suggestion of how to get us by this little conundrum we have. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, and yes, muted, sir. Yeah. I thought I was unmuted. You're unmuted now. I should be unmuted. Okay, thank you. Uh, you can hear me, yes? Yes. Okay, uh, so. Um, I think uh, where Michelle is going is uh, in terms of a staged approach uh, to this is we really need to uh, get going and kind of uh, look at all of the school sites that we're talking about and kind of determine which ones make sense to move forward more quickly on and which ones uh, maybe make more sense to, to delay into the next school year or the, even the school year after that. And so I think it part of where we'd like to do as we approach this thing is we we want to work with the district administration and you and figure out where our priorities are as a as a group and then take that forward. And uh, I think that would be our best approach to this is kind of to get going, understand where um, where the critical um sites are, if you will, uh, to approach first and then kind of start moving through it. If we get going, and as Michelle said, we discover that there are places where there are, needs to be more discussion or um, it, it, we, the, the school doesn't have the bandwidth to do it right at a particular moment, we will adjust our timing. I've done this with lots of school districts and I know how hard it is for schools and the teachers and the administrators to make time for this. And so we're going to have to be really sensitive and thoughtful about our approach as we go uh, school to school. Commitment from this gentleman, I would be willing to have a change of heart and go ahead and support the motion. So I don't know what if anybody else has a comment. Okay, so we have we do have a motion from uh, Trustee Gonzalez and the second by Trustee Canova. We're ready. I think we're ready for a vote. So all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay, so that um, passes five to one. Um, Trustee Fairchild. Michelle, uh, it just shows you're a wizard. I, I just did want to ask, um, how are you going to get board input on these, uh, on the, the order? So uh, we could do, we would most likely do a short study session. Um, and we've been doing that uh, for these master plans. And so I don't see it being really any different for a whole district wide master plan is that we would schedule um, hopefully on a day that um, it's not a heavy agenda. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know, funny, right? Um, You're funny. But um, that we would, we would get your input and we of course would get input from the administrators at each of the school sites and, um, and maintenance. Um, and we would do that after we start kind of analyzing our conditions, facility conditions assessment um we'll we'll prioritize those schools especially with maintenance and um so we'll we'll be scheduling discussions with you so would that be before the summer or after the summer um i think what to the board's purview um okay. i think we can discuss that um later but it could be either so okay we'll be starting the conditions assessment no matter what so, um, and then if there's, if there are two schools that you want us to focus on, then we would focus on those, but um, two, one, two, whatever. Okay, I'll work with the superintendent on, on that. Great, well, thank you very much. And thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are moving on to M.1, approval of the adoption of additional sixth and eighth grade supplemental core instructional materials for middle school English language arts. Motion to approve, Roderman. Second, Gonzalez. Okay, I have, um, Motion from Trustee Ratterman, second from Trustee Gonzalez. Any comments? Any comments from the public in the room or on Zoom? Nope. Okay, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? So that passes six to zero. Okay, next is N.1, report from the Director of School Bond Projects. It's an information item, but Larry's in the room. Um, you all read it. Are we good to go? And we also have the report from Director of Facility Development Planning. We've heard a lot about those things tonight. Um, Trustee Ratterman? Just one thing. Um, in the report from the Director of Facilities Development Planning, 
the cut and paste lost the link and it just put the descriptor as opposed to the URL. So if you could just provide those, it wasn't, I started to send a memo and just decided life was, do it later, thanks. I sort of lumped them together. Um, okay, uh, and can you send that update out to us and update the agenda? I guess that would mean. Okay, great. You have a question about the, which one? Uh, facility. Okay, facility development planning. Um, so I submitted a question because we keep talking about the size of parcels um, of, of our land. And we need to also look at that in relation to the streets that surround the land. I was told that we didn't have that information this afternoon. I happen to have 30 minutes on hand, so I got it myself. Here you go. You want to, this is the, what we couldn't get me. Um, and one of the things. Uh, so I just made a little chart. Uh, Google Maps, I can't, uh, ex I can't, I could, there were some things worth the bike lanes I couldn't quite see. But one of the things that I was really, uh, I, as we look at these parcels of land. Trustee, and Trustee Fairchild, I don't think anybody knows, you need to set the foundation for what you're talking about. Okay, sorry. In the facility report, we again have the size of all of these various parcels of land by acreage. And in the past, and when we, this has come up multiple times, one of the things that I think that's important along with the acreage are the streets surrounding that, particularly at Peterson, Patrick Henry, which are two lane streets, no bike lanes, sometimes a sidewalk, sometimes not. They have the worst streets in the entire district around that beautiful parcel of land, uh, Peterson. Um, and so, so I just I just pulled up Google Maps, took 30 minutes, went through all the schools, made a little chart, because I think that's an important piece when we're talking about how we're going to use the facilities, is how what the access is like. Like for example, the middle turning lane. If you have a middle turning lane, that means your traffic flow is better. Okay, that's that's why that's on there. Whether or not there's a bike lane, whether or not there's a sidewalk, is it two lanes or four lanes? How all of those things impact the flow of traffic, and especially when we're looking at getting to a school. Um, now I have to say that there the Google map from around the Agnew property was not recent, so I couldn't tell if it was five lanes or four lanes. So those are the question marks. If it's just a slash on the chart I made, um, that means um, that it's only one way or it's iffy. Um, some of the schools have multiple drop-off points, so they have a two lane and a four lane. But anyway, you can look at this because I think this is very important to information to look at when we're looking at these parcels of land because it's more than the land size, it's how you get there. So I'll just make a comment on that. One thing that we have done and we will do for the master plan is we also have hired a transportation consultant. And so they work with the city and um, one of the things that we're doing with the new Laurelwood campus is we are working on a new transportation. We're working with the city transportation department as well as our consultant to figure out how to get all that traffic off of either Teal or Dunford, where it's coming from, where the students live. So we're incorporating all of that analysis where we think they might be walking and biking from and driving from. And so that goes into the analysis for all of our school sites. Yeah, and one of the th reasons why I wanted it to come from the district is because I don't have the information from safe routes. And so I just was able to go on, on Google Maps. And it is a little frustrating because at this point, I, I don't know how to ask a question and get an answer. And I, I know this is not 100% accurate, but... Um, I just, I guess I would appreciate an answer when it's asked. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dr. Kemp, did you get a copy of this? Yes, I did. And I, I just want to share that the question was asked and staff didn't have time to prepare an answer. 
for this uh, for this request uh, that came um, earlier this week. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on then. We're up to planning. So O.1 is Measure BB Projects and Financial Update. So I'm just teeing up and then I'll turn it over to Larry, but we haven't had an opportunity to bring a brief project update and a financial update for the Measure BB Projects. So that'll be the first part of this presentation is just, uh, Larry will have just a brief summary of where we are with each of the projects. Um, the, pre the preliminary budget spend to date, and then also just a reminder of other projects that were also included in Measure BB during the planning cycle uh, that were currently unfunded. Uh, so a brief analysis of that, um, and then we'll be open to any questions or discussion. Thanks. I don't think it'll take the full 50 minutes. We appreciate that. <laughs> Joe, could I uh, prevail on you to advance the slides for me? I'll get this going the wrong way. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, during the early uh, planning stages of Measure BB, there were uh, numerous facility needs that were identified and considered for possible future funding. And those needs were the result of a roughly two year uh, facility needs survey and, and uh, a, a planning um, effort that took place with the committee that I co-chaired with uh, uh, then CBO Mark Allgaier. The total uh, uh, estimate uh, of all of those facility needs was in the order of about $1.5 billion. And that was presented to the board in January of 2000, uh, 2018. And then in August of 2018, uh, the board uh, condensed that list of uh, projects uh, or needs down to a list that totaled to 720 million. And that was the amount of the bond authorization that was, was passed in Measure BB. And then in the, um, in the spring of 2019, uh, the board uh, approved the master plan for the implementation of Measure BB. And that's the plan we've been working on ever since. We, we, we've not uh, changed that plan. Next, next slide. Yeah, thanks. So what we have here is a chart of uh, our, our a budget that was ad adopted in the, the facility uh, mass measure BB master plan. The total budget comes up to the bond authorization of 720 million. 562 million of that was devoted for specific uh, uh, construction projects, total project costs. Uh, the balance was is a cost escalation reserve for inflation, program scope reserve, uh, an amount for program management costs and estimated bond issuance costs. As Mark said, we've sold uh, one half of those bonds now. So uh, the first bond sale was um, a 300 and 360 million. And of that to date, we've spent uh, 146 million, or to date, at, to date meaning uh, uh, December 30th, December 31st of 2021. Um, we use that because we could tie easily to uh, QCC reports uh, mid year. Uh, the bulk of those expenditures have been on the Agnews High School. The total Agnews budget is 250 million. Uh, we've expended 95.3 million. We have 98.6 million in remaining encumbrances. Uh, so there's a balance to spend of 55 million. Uh, we're roughly halfway in terms of expenditures on the McDonald High School. And so um, we, we're, we're assuming that we'll expend uh, the bulk of that. We could have some savings, but it's too early to make that just yet. Can you define encumbered? Pardon me? Will you define encumbered? Encumbered means purchase orders that have been issued. Okay, so if there was additional work that has not yet been encumbered, it would come out of the 55 million? Yes, we're in the process of uh, completing furniture purchases and some remaining small contracts and, and change orders. Change orders have not, not been encumbered. So we think we're in pretty good shape, but I, I don't want to start counting savings until we're, we're much closer to being complete. Um, and then um, 
the remaining projects, exterior site improvement projects, our budget is 21 million. Uh, our costs are uh, just shy of that. I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. High school fields replacements were, were slightly less, uh, but for the purposes of this, if I go down to the total, uh, we've expended 146 million. We have 101 million remaining in contracts and purchase orders to expend. And we have, balance, uh, we have a balance of 472. But the Patrick Henry, Peterson, Laurelwood projects of contracts have not been awarded on those or the Briarwood, Bracker or Westwood campus projects. Next slide, please. So going down through the list of projects at Kathleen McDonald High School, budget is 250 million. To date, we've spent 95 million. That the school is on track to open in August of 22. We have expenditures yet to uh, uh, yet or expen expenses yet to incur. So again, we still have uh, some risks out there. Again, we've, we're we're pretty confident that our budget's sufficient, but uh, we would like to wait until we're much closer to completion to say any more than that. Measure BB projects at Patrick Henry Peterson Laurelwood. Uh, the budget is 112 million for the total of those projects. To date, we've only expended 75,000 and that's on campus master planning. Uh, we anticipate that by spring, you will have uh, master plans to review and hopefully by uh, late spring, early summer, we will be able to, to issue design contracts and get going with um, uh, the completion of the, of the bond funded portion of those projects. Next is uh, Measure BB exterior site improvement projects. Those projects were shade structures, play structures, um, um, uh, fencing and gating on the elementary schools. Uh, our budget was 21 million. We've paid to date uh, just slightly less than that. We have remaining work to do on, on that uh, portion of the program. The scope on those projects was significantly more than what we originally uh, budgeted, um, but it was those were in order to keep equity between the schools uh, and respond to needs that came up after we did our original assessment. Uh, we've gone ahead and completed those projects. Most of the work that I think that we have yet to do, we can fund out of Measure uh, Measure J two thousand and fourteen an appropriate expenditure in under that bond projects list. And we're working through uh, those projects right now. You said J, did you mean to say H? Pardon me, I'm sorry, it, measure H 2014. Yes. High school fields uh, at Santa Clara and Wilcox, our budget was 19 point, uh, roughly 19.5 million, paid to date 18.5. Uh, we're using savings from those those projects are complete and we were able with savings to in, uh, to include uh, resurfacing the all weather tracks and the save remaining savings we're using to do the uh, to the, do the design and permitting of a replacement tennis courts at Wilcox High School and the concession building that design is underway we we have approval from the board just to do design and permitting when that's done, we'll bring detailed estimates to you with the, uh, so that you can decide on, on proceeding and what source of funding to go from there. Uh, measure BB roof replacement, uh, our budget was 17.2 million. We've paid to date uh, seven point, roughly 7.6. We have some projects to close out, contracts to close out yet. And we're working on uh, a final phase of that project to redo um, covered walkway roofs. Um, there are many walkway roofs that we didn't do when we did uh, school modernization uh, with the expectation that we would come back and do them later or have them done under deferred maintenance. So this is our opportunity. We've got the team together. We're, we're um, going through and, and um, we hope to be able to do those projects this summer, uh, it's going to be a challenge. There's material shortages and um, DSA backlogs, but we're strategizing everything we can do to get as much of that work done this summer as possible. 
Uh, Measure BB, New Valley High School, uh, we, we have not begun planning on that yet. Uh, um, I think Michelle covered that in her presentation. Measure BB, Briarwood, Bracker, Westwood, uh, the master planning projects are underway. Um, we anticipate by spring, uh, you will have uh, master plans uh, to review and that we hope by, by June, July, we'll be able to start uh, bringing uh, design contracts to you so we can get going on those projects. Um, other financial needs, um, the, um, as I said, the, the master, approved master plan uh, included a subset of projects that were considered in the facility needs task force that totaled up to 1.5 billion. And I was asked to go through a list of those um, and give an idea of what, what the budgets were for the, those projects and what was not included in the, in the master plan for measure BB. Um, before I do that, I just a, a word about how the projects were put together in the facility needs um, report. Um, we took a look at the, at the campuses in a, in a bit of a holistic way. And we went school by school. We interviewed the staff and the principals at each school. And having worked on those schools for 15, 20 years, we had a pretty good idea of what, uh, what the needs were and um, high priority uh, facility issues. And we asked the principals to prioritize what they saw were deficiencies in their facilities as well. So when we estimated those, we put them together as consolidated projects. So if you took a school, I, I'm just going to say Brawley, for example, we looked at replacing windows, we looked at pick up and drop off, we looked at um, uh, finishes, we looked at technology, we put all the needs together and said if we were to do Brawley and accomplish all of these uh, scopes of work at one time, what would that cost? And that got consolidated into major projects at each school. Well, when it became apparent that there wasn't enough money to do that at every school, we started breaking those, those costs down again. And I, if you remember what we went through to try to get to the 720 million uh, for the amount of measure BB, it was, it, it was a difficult effort to try to pull those numbers apart, put them to, back together again in, in something that made sense. So when I talk about what was not included in measure B and the numbers, the numbers are, if, if you said, go do that now, and that's how much it will cost, it would be, it would be difficult quickly to come to that number. So these consider these orders of magnitude numbers. So uh, unfunded uh, video surveillance. Um, several years ago, the district, um, uh, you approved a project to put video surveillance cameras on all the schools. And at that time, it was about a three, three and a half million dollar project. Um, and then um, the, the need for video surveillance increased quite a bit. So we went back to see if we did another sweep in the district, what would that cost? And that came up to about 1.5 million. And that was to extend the system that was at current at that time. If we were to do it again today, it would probably be a much different system. Uh, shade structures, we included amounts for shade structures on the secondary schools. Santa Clara, Wilcox, Bookser, Cabrillo, Peterson, and Wilson High School. Those uh, did not make it on the list. Our estimate at the time was about 1.4 million. Uh, window upgrades. When we modernized um, Wilson uh, at, uh, at Options, a Central Park, and the uh, Millican School on the Mariposa site, we had the opportunity to replace the old single single glazed steel sash uh, windows. We estimated what it would cost to do that to all the schools. And um, that did not make it on the, uh, in, the, in the plan except for Briarwood, Bracker and Westwood. So breaking out the piece for the other schools, it came up to about 28.2 million. 
uh, site lighting. Um, we looked at site lighting. These were high priority issues at Montague, Peterson, Santa Clara High School, Wilcox High School, and Wilson Ed Options. Um, and totaling up those identified needs, we came up to 1.2 million. Unfunded list restroom additions and upgrades, um, we came up to about 15.5 million. Again, those were part of overall major modernization projects. Um, and that today, if we were to do that today, that would be substantially more, and it would probably be a, a more difficult to des design issue because of the expectations for gender neutrality and things and things like that. Unfunded list traffic improvements. We took a stab at um, dealing with uh, pick up and drop off and traffic uh, congestion issues on all the school sites. Those became possible if we were doing complete campus uh, reconfigurations. Um, just to go out and expand a pick up and drop off lane or a parking lot, um, you can nibble around the edges, but it's very difficult to, to make a significant improvement without major facility upgrades. And we have the opportunity to do that at uh, Briarwood, Bracker, and Westwood because we've consolidated so much work on those campuses and there the scope will probably include a replacement buildings that could be located in different locations so the number we 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 had for that was about 22.9 million uh unfunded list uh, path of travel um peterson nature center uh, wilson ed options laurel wood was included in there and i can't remember why <laughs> We had uh, an, uh, other projects at Laurelwood, but nevertheless, um, uh, that comes to about uh, 12.4 million. And that would mean wholesale replacement of uh, sidewalks, uh, asphalt paving, um, and things like that. There are so many um, make do, make uh, um, situations out there that, uh, that um, asphalt and concrete and landscaping and just doing it in a, co in a coordinated way was what we were trying to do here. And our number there was 12.4 uh, uh, million. Uh, unfunded list elementary field improvements. Um, this is something that um, that is not made it in, I think any bond, it was considered in, in measure B in 1997. Um, and it, it's it's fallen off the list on every bond measure, um, but the the number that we put together there was for fourteen point one million. That would be made turf renovation, irrigation, uh, related landscaping. Um, uh, secondary outdoor athletics, uh, bleachers, tracks, uh, paving, uh, eighteen million. We were able to accomplish a big piece of that within the uh, Wilcox and Santa Clara Fields improvement projects with the uh, replacement of the uh, um, uh, all weather track surface. Patrick Henry Field and Farms. This would be a, uh, an improve, or improvements to the farm itself. And um, the Patrick Henry, um, the, the soccer field look currently located on Patrick Henry. Um, that, that amounted to 20, 21.3 million, and this is on top of the 112 million that did make it in to measure BB. Uh, Curtis and Wilson Fields, upgrading those facilities, 11.7. Unfunded classroom improvements. Again, when we took a look at the campus and, and, and assessed all the needs that were identified, we put them in the consolidated projects and in the, in the breakdown, the process to break those numbers down in a way that you could consolidate them into uh, a bond measure. We took a percentage of the work in the classrooms and this represented 12% uh, of that total, 15.6 uh, million. That would have covered finishes, uh, classroom technology, um, um, uh, interior finishes that didn't get improved during uh, the, the the HVAC uh, project. Uh, and so there's there's just a shopping list of things in there and we just broke it down into uh, a 12% and 88%. You'll see the 88% in a minute here. 
unfunded list high school improvements. That was um, um, swimming pool boilers. I think those have since been replaced with deferred maintenance and modernization of the high school science buildings. Those were opened in 1999, 2000, um, and um, they're, they're they're in serious need of, of attention right now. They didn't, uh, since they were new in 99, 2000, we never went back to do anything more with them in uh, bond funds, with bond funds. So the roofs are at the end of their useful life. The HVAC system has never been incorporated into the uh, overall district um, uh, HVAC management system, um, interior classrooms, uh, the technology is 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 now falling behind other school uh, classrooms. So, um, but we were not able to get that into the uh, bond measure. But and our estimate of that was seventeen point eight. Elementary school offices. Um, we had the opportunity to build new uh, office administration buildings at uh, Central Park and Millican. Uh, we, we did. Uh, we also did one at Wilson. And this was a plan to uh, build those similar facilities on all the elementary schools. Uh, and that's 32 million. Uh, Multi-purposes in kitchens. Um, we looked at uh, the uh, multi-purpose building on the Agnew Elementary School as a model. Uh, our, element, our elementary multi-purpose buildings just don't work. If major work has to be done in the kitchens, I don't know how you're going to do it because you can't. You can't comply with the ADA requirements and health department requirements in the, ti the tiny spaces that exist out there right now. So this was a dream to replace multi-purpose buildings on all the elementary schools, 116 million. Affordable replacement, um, the district has uh, 250 portable buildings. I think the last building we built, the last portables we bought were about 10 years ago. They have an expected useful life of 25 years. So um, that's a real need that is, is going to become more and more apparent as the years go by and our budget to replace all of them. Actually, it wasn't to replace them. It was to try to incorporate those spaces into new permanent buildings. It was 185 million. Classroom improvements, this is the other 88%. Um, some of the things that we looked at there was PE storage, um, offices uh, for uh, support personnel, uh, wellness, maker spaces, uh, things like that got incorporated into that uh, bucket of uh, projects. High school furniture, 1.8 million. I think a lot of that, uh, or some of that was taken up under uh, available funding, a one-time funding under, um, uh, a program that Mark Allgaier implemented. Uh, books are outdoor athletics. This was to deal with the um, Townsend Field, uh, replace the bleachers that were built in the 1930s, uh, replace uh, the concession buildings, uh, build adequate restrooms, um, reconstruct Elmer Johnson Field, and then take over uh, Washington Park and and what was included in this was the opportunity to re reconfigure the Bookser campus. Um, that's a huge amount of money, and I can understand why that didn't make it into the bond. But at that time, we were looking at about 55 million. Martinson property, uh, during, I think during the time that we were doing the master plan, the district was able to acquire that property. And this was um, an estimate to build a district facility there that could be used for. Uh, for, um, uh, for district uh, uh, student use. So the summary of all those projects uh, comes up to about um, uh, 697 million. Any questions? Anyone wanna change their vote on the $600,000 master plan? <laughs> okay, so we'll start with uh, Trustee Ratterman with questions. So you, you talked about a lot of, of, of things in there. Um, one of them was ADA paths. Um, are we currently compliant? Um, I, 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 I want to say no. 
but I need to qualify that. Okay, so that's something we should check on, obviously. If, if, if we take a project to DSA uh, for approval, for most projects as part of the uh, plan review, they assess the path of travel on, on the campus um, for the, the required path of travel. And in most cases, we have to do improvements. Uh, the code is, is, is changing every code cycle. The requirements become more and more stringent. So I would say, I, mean, well, I had an architect tell me once that 99.9% um, .9 of the percent of the buildings in any given location don't meet the current code. Only the new buildings meet the current code. So, um, so th there are there are needs out there. So. Okay. So um, it's a minor issue, but fencing uh, that you're still working on that. Do you have is in part of the, that's part that's already funded. Um, are you finishing the job at uh, Bowers? There's that section. Yes, that's that's included in there. Um, and Martinson, uh, you may not know this question. It's you know the. Uh, is that continuing on, and do we do receive revenue from that, or? Mark, I I can't answer that. Okay, I see. Help coming. Yes, um, they do lease it from us. Um, it was so when the property changed hands, it changed for no money. Um, it used to be city property, and then um, it RDA property. So they um, they do pay us. It's not much. Um, they do support, in case some of you aren't aware, Martinson Child Development Center um, supports basically a six-month-old to um, preschool, kindergarten age children, and a lot of it is subsidized by the state. Um, but they do pay us a little bit, um, and then we now have been maintaining the building, and they're very grateful for that because we fixed um, a lot of things for them, but they, we do get a small amount of revenue from them. The reason I asked the question is a $13 million, bring it up to whatever. And I was worried because I knew we didn't charge much. I'm worried that we're going to get this big surprise down the road. By the way, you have to bring it up to standards and it would be a drain on the system. So, but, but you've given me enough to, it's not something we're planning to do right this minute. Um, the one thing I'm concerned a little bit about, and I think you're already addressing it with the other $600,000, whatever it was, but um, I remember B, as a matter of fact, you talked about the multi-purpose rooms. We redid almost all the multi-purpose rooms or brought them up to some version of a standard in their measure B on all our elementary. Now we're sitting there, we haven't quite gotten through all of the process and we're already back to doing that. And we haven't set any money aside for it. So the concern is that what we're using is bonds to do our maintenance so it goes its useful life, we have to replace it. We've said no set-asides to replace these things, which is what a prudent business would do. And I know we're not a business, but we should still act like one. And so my hope is that when we have this master plan that's going into place, that one of the things we will do is make sure that we every year, as part of the budget, we set aside X dollars to take care of those things. When they come up, boom, we hit them. And we're not constantly going back out to get this stuff done through bond measures. You hit the nail on the head. That is the um, most important part of having a deferred maintenance plan is not only having the plan, but then start budgeting for those replacements at some point in time down the future. So uh, just as a reminder, under state law, school districts are required to spend 3% of their budget annually, 3% of their general fund budget annually on what is called routine restricted maintenance. Those are those deferred maintenance items. If you don't spend the whole 3%, then it gets carried over into future years in perpetuity for qualifying return re routine restricted maintenance accounts. There are many districts who are doing this and, and have started saying, you know what, 3% is not enough. We're going to do 4%. We're not going to, we're going to put the 1% aside for the future. Uh, I know one district is doing as much as 6% a year and setting that money aside. So eventually down the road, they're not going to have to, or they, it'll minimize them having to go back. So this provides, again, that roadmap and that plan for us in the future. But you hit the nail on the head about planning for it. Yeah, that's what I'd like to see us do. And I would like to, I'm not worried about the percentage. I want to find out what the real, real replacement costs would be. We plan for it. When it comes up, it's no big deal. We need to put a new roof in. Boom, the funds are there. Okay. Um, I'm actually really glad that we're doing the this planning that we talked about earlier. 
um, because there's a lot of things in this list and, and you've listed it as a planning item. And I'm wondering like, what kind of planning do we need to do specifically? Because I don't know that we wanna take any of those items that we haven't funded and just say, oh, with the leftover money, do this, because those may not be the highest priority and those, and we don't know what the actual cost is gonna be because it's out of date. So, um, so I'm actually looking forward to getting some more information because I think we will have some money left over in Measure BB and it'll be important to figure out what we wanna do with that. It's a, it's a real opportunity to do something that we didn't know about a few years ago when we passed Measure BB. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, okay, then we are good. Thank you so much for all this information. We really appreciate you putting it all together. Okay, next item then, we will move on. You know, I should have looked out for public comment. Is there any public comment? I don't see any, okay. Okay, moving on to 0.2, revised job description for the teacher librarian. Any questions? Otherwise it'll come back for action. Do you have any information about what changed? I don't know. If, was there was there some driving thing to to bring this forward? Mr. Con Dr. Gonzalez, do you have an update on um, the teacher librarian also, position? Teacher librarian update. It didn't have uh, like strikeout or anything, so it just has the new description. Let's see. Um, no, there is actually, um, there was a revision in some of the language um, and we removed um, some components that included, for example, co-teaching. So it was, it was not to do co-teaching, but collaboration. Um, and also the formatting, the main thing with this was uh, the formatting to use some of the fonts that we're using um, the structure that we utilize in creating the new job descriptions. So those were the main changes that okay. that have uh, that were included here. Great, thank you, um, Trustee Rutterman. Yeah, I, I would just like to make a request and revise job descriptions. I know personally it would be very helpful to me to see what was changed. So the old versus the new, with maybe a red line or whatever technique is easy for you to do and things like, because I couldn't care less about font changes, but I do care about uh, substantive changes in responsibilities. So, but appreciate it. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Yeah, or some information about what, what the changes were, or what, what was driving it. Okay, thank you. So we will bring that back for action uh, at the next meeting. Okay. Um, so uh, I think I'm going to skip items from the board. The board needs to go back into closed session. So we will be doing that now and uh, we'll come out when we're done. I just uh, Ed, I, have, I just wanted to let you know, I'm going to have to leave you at 1145 because I have to get up really early. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Do you want to stop the screening of the meeting, streaming of the meeting? No, we aren't. So I'll stay here with Joe. Sixteen, or we'll go over to thirty-six across the hallway. Okay, is the is it still locked? Unlocked over there? Okay, thank you.
Okay, thank you. So uh, the board is back from closed session and uh, we discussed item B.6. Uh, so I will take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn, Rotterman. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Definitely. And that passes, any opposed? That passes five to zero. Well,